Good morning and welcome to the conference. We would ask for yet another minute of your patience. Здравейте, добро утро. Добре дошли на нашата онлайн конференция за отопление и реновиране. Моля за още минутка търпение преди да стартираме и да дадем начало на днешния ден. Good morning, everyone. We're resuming our conference with the second day of it. Добро утро на всички. Продължаваме конференцията в седмичната. Good morning, everyone. Repeating in Bulgarian, which is the second day of the conference. Welcome. Let's quickly go through the rules of using Zoom. through um, the Zoom instructions. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them uh, in the chat. Firstly, uh, you can uh, just raise a hand if you have any question and you can <clears throat> ask your uh, question in the chat. Um, if you want, we can also um, unmute your microphone so you'll be able to ask your question uh, directly in front of the audience. При положение, че имате че имате въпроси, може да... Same thing in English. If you have a question, you can raise your hand on Zoom. You can also write in the chat box to ask questions to our panelists. You can also ask us to unmute you so that you can ask your question in front of everybody in this conference. On the Zoom menu, you will find an interpretation button where you can select the language you would like to listen to the conference, uh, the conference to. Uh, the language, the preferred language that you will, would like to follow the conference. And uh, briefly, I will uh, just share the program for today. Uh, firstly, we're going to um, uh, watch two very short videos about the transition of the district heating system systems in Munich and in Helsinki. And the first panel of the day, it's um, related to district heating and the transformation of the district heating network to renewable energy and how we could do that. Uh, our first presenter in the first panel, it's uh, going to be uh, Davor Pechevsky from uh, Bankwatch Network for Central and Eastern Europe. 
uh, with the topic of heating issues and initiatives around the uh, CEE region. Uh, then we're going to continue with uh, Filip Vilka and his presentation on district heating systems and the Slovak just transition for Prievidza region in uh, Slovakia. And uh, we're going to finish the first panel with uh, greening the district heating in Germany and uh, some policy recommendations from our friends Peter Achmels and Judith Grunert. The second part, uh, the second part of the day, it's uh, going to be um, related to the financial models available today, and uh, we're going to have speakers from the World Bank, Vasil Zvatev, uh, Kirill Rajcev from the Alliance for Energy Efficiency, and uh, Eva Petkova from the Regional Fund uh, of South Bulgaria. Uh, so I would um, just like to open the first. The first video, uh, and I will give um, the stage to my colleague. Again. Thank you very much, Svetlio. Uh, just a quick warm up with two videos and very short presentations uh, focused on the transition of two district heatings uh, around, uh, which we'll speak about a little bit more. But uh, uh, in, in any case, the first video that we are going to see, uh, we took from YouTube, it's from the channel of Bau Industry Bayern, uh, and uh, it speaks about the uh, uh, Munich district heating going, going truly renewable. It is a project of scale. It's the Germany's largest geo, uh, de, uh, deep geothermal plant that is currently being built, and it's in Munich. It is a part of the modernization project of the district heating of Munich, which has been around at uh, uh, the spot of Schaffen, Schafferstrasse Street, and it has been generating electricity already for 120 years to date. The time when uh, this district heating was used to burn coal and waste is long gone and the new production facility has been under construction in the last couple of years to the south side of the city. The construction is being developed around the motto that the future belongs to the renewable energy. In this case, it is going to be counting on the disposable geothermal energy in the region. Uh, under Munich, uh, there is a huge amount of thermal water. It is natural source that occurs at the depth of two, three thousand meters. The thermal water from these deposits can be used for the heat supply of Munich. The thermal water is with temperatures of around 100 degrees and depending on where uh, one is situated in the urban area, it is warmer to the south and a little bit colder uh, as, uh, as deposits to the north. The drilling is done already and the facility is supposed to start operation this autumn if all goes according to the schedule. The steel works have employed um, on average of 15 to 20 workers a day, various, uh, various uh, workers pipeline assemblers, civil engineers, scaffolders, and others. And the project is indeed a special challenge. The works are not something that is done on a daily basis in the construction sector, but uh, um, um, people had to accept the task and uh, invest really uh, various in-house expertise into it. Um, At the end of the video, uh, I think it would be the most important part that we are going to see. Uh, it's actually a gigantic thermal storage that is uh, uh, that is provided uh, um, uh, that is provided as part of the system. It is a huge tank, a tower um, which can um, uh, fit in about forty thousand cubic meters of hot water. Uh, uh, where in which the heat can be stored uh, reliably and uh, it can cover the flexible demand of water and warmth uh, of hot water and warmth in the city for quite some time. Um, this is important because we know that uh, there are certain moments of peak demand uh, when it comes to the use of, uh, of, 
of heat due to the way uh, um, the consumption goes in the city uh, and other moments where uh, the, the, uh, there are like um, downfalls of this, uh, of this demand, but the um, thermal storage is something that helps this to be uh, well mitigated. Now, um, as we said, there's a second and even more interesting uh, warm up video that we would like to show you. Um, we are showing these videos because we try to invite uh, both uh, uh, representatives from both uh, district heating uh, companies, the one from Munich and the one from Helsinki. Unfortunately, um, they could not join. I'm sure that at the moment they are uh, really the stars around Europe and they have they're constantly bombarded with uh, requests to uh, participate. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, Finland, you're going to hear now, but this time we're going to need some sound, I think. Uh, I don't know if it's ready. Let's go ahead. I will enter the role of a football commentator because I'm afraid the sound doesn't work uh, at the moment. But um, following what is uh, what is being subtitled, uh, basically Helsinki uh, decided to open uh, uh, what they call the energy challenge. It was a competition for ideas how to turn the district heating network and uh, uh, the energy use in Helsinki uh, into carbon neutral one. The challenge for Finland is very special because the country has the ambitious goal to go carbon neutral fully by 2035. Um, and this, this includes uh, uh, Finland and of course the capital city of Helsinki. Uh, so far the district heating uh, network has been um, uh, supplied with uh, with energy, with heat uh, through cogeneration units uh, that are using coal and gas. Uh, and uh, coal in Finland has to be actually phased out by 2029. Uh, already at a very early stage, uh, Finland uh, has ruled out um, and the city of Helsinki has ruled out the idea to use biomass for the transition of uh, the district heating network uh, because uh, they were fearing that this will put unnecessary to high pressure on the forests of Finland. While um, electrification of heating uh, is already the emerging future uh, resolution, as it seems, for uh, the sustainable uh, provision of, uh, of heating. Uh, and in this case, basically, uh, the end of this uh, energy challenge is that uh, uh, most of the plans are going towards the use of heat pumps. How exactly this is going to happen is something that we'll be learning hopefully firsthand from uh, the developers in the, in the years to come. But now I'm giving the floor back to uh, my colleague Svetoslav uh, so that we can continue with the program of this panel. Hello again, and uh, we are continuing with uh, the first presentation. Uh, it is going uh, to be a presentation from uh, Davor Najewski from the Bankwatch Network of Central and uh, Eastern Europe. And the Bankwatch Network have uh, really played an important role in the last few years in promoting the transition in the domestic energy heating networks. So we're going to hear uh, from Davor about the new developments in this field in our uh, region. 
Uh, so I, I'm uh, giving the stage uh, to, to Davor. I think uh, that you can uh, load your presentation and go to the slide. If there are some technical issues, uh, we're just here to assist you. Okay, Davor? Yeah, hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you see my presentation? We can see it. Everything is all right. Excellent. Uh, so again, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to to have the chance to present this part of our work. Um, my presentation will be most focused on the Western Balkan region because this is where we focused our efforts uh, recently. But the Bank Coach Network was quite active uh, in Central Europe also. Uh, I think there is a presentation later on that will present one of the uh one of the projects that we were involved in uh, i will start with explaining the current situation in the western balkan region uh, so heating is here dominate, dominated completely but fo by fossil fuels and inefficient burning of wood uh, this is both for district heating systems and individual heating uh, and probably the worst of all uh, is that it's combined with really low degree of energy efficiency. And I can give the example here for uh, North Macedonia, for example. Uh, we had a study several years ago that uh, probably 75, 80% of the household do don't have even the basic energy efficiency uh, measures. Uh, Using of wood is uh, usually linked with a uh, low degree uh, of uh, sustainability criteria that are implemented and uh, also it's not the best solution uh, as we also saw from the videos before for uh, for Helsinki. Um, I will switch completely to district heating systems now. Uh, they're all old and inefficient. They're all built before uh, 85, 1985, I think, uh, most of them. Uh, they have uh, significant network losses. Uh, they offer no flexibility to consumers over billing and consumption. So uh, yeah, it's uh, the reliance of these uh, district heating systems is really, really inefficient in the region and uh, it is causing a big problem with the total decarbonization uh, objectives for the region. Uh, district heating, heating systems in the Western Balkan systems, as you can see, are 97% fossil fuel based, only 3% are based on uh, renewable energy, and that's mostly biomass. Uh, out of that, you can see that 21% are still based uh, using coal, lignite, 67% uh, uh, natural gas, 9% uh, uh, petroleum product, products, oil, uh, and mazut also, so uh, residual oil, basically, which is highly polluting. Uh, it... Uh, these systems that we're using are mostly second generation systems. They're running on really high temperatures above 100 degrees uh, centigrade, used for space heating only, uh, which is also another problem because what uh, uh, excuse me, excuse me yeah. for a second. Uh, we cannot see the change of slides in your presentation. Oh, maybe you can reload it or something. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, is it working now? Yes, now it's okay. Yes, now it's okay. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so this is the slide I was uh, speaking about so far. Uh, yeah, it's mostly second generation systems. I will get, uh, I will give more details about that later on. Uh, 
running on high temperatures above 100 degrees uh, centigrade. Uh, it's used only for space heating, which is also another problem. Water heating uh, for household use is supplied mostly by uh, electric boilers installed in each individual home. Uh, the countries that have somewhat developed district heating systems are Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Kosovo, and North Macedonia. There are plans for Montenegro. Uh, but the thing is that this is highly localized and it's connected to already existing uh, electricity producing plants. Uh, especially in North Macedonia, there is only district heating in, in Skopje, for example. In Serbia, there are only three, four cities. I think that it's the same in uh, Bosnia. <clears throat> um, and most of these district heating systems are connected to cogeneration plants. Uh, you can see on the slide, 30% in Bosnia. 94% in Kosovo, 56% in North Macedonia, on, only 13 in Serbia. Uh, and the, the cogeneration plants in Tuzla and Beograd are running on uh, coal lignite, which is also highly polluting and not really suitable for uh, densely populated areas. Uh, in res with respect to individual heating, I will just mention here that households and the public uh, or industrial sector, it's, there is widespread use of coal also for households uh, because it's uh, cheap, it's easy to buy on the market. Uh, also biomass, mostly wood and pellets, and they, these are most of the time often burnt in inefficient stoves without any filters, without pollution control and without any uh, enforcement mechanisms for this. Uh, I will give an introduction to what's second generation of district heating. Uh, ah, sorry, this was supposed to be later on, but yeah. Uh, so this is a, these are technologies developed which, between 1930 and 1980. So this is already quite old technology. They're using pressurized hot water, water systems that runs uh, at above 100 degrees centigrade uh, through the network. Uh, usually it's around 60, 70 degrees when it comes back to the power plant. Uh, they're closed systems uh, most of the time. Uh, in the uh, <clears throat> Traditionally, they're using mostly fossil fuels and based incineration. Uh, the efficiency of this system is low to medium because is using uh, really high temperature uh, water uh, and it takes a lot of energy to, uh, to get the water to this temperature. Uh, so yeah, this was supposed to be before, uh, but here you can see better. This is uh, like the history of district heating gen uh, generation. Um, the first generation is uh, using steam uh coal and waste also and it's mostly local district heating this is really extremely old it's i don't think it's used anywhere uh, right now anymore uh second generation uh, like i said uh everything every technology that was developed before 1980 uh, mostly cogeneration plants based on coal oil and uh, later on gas also uh, the next uh, steps in this uh, industry heating happened uh, after 1980, and here we can see on the slide, <coughs> sorry, that we already have large-scale solar. Uh, we have industrial surplus. Uh, we have uh, also biomass, which was not used before, and. Um, in the next, in the latest stage for generation heating, which is happening right now, uh, we can see that we have uh, heat storage, what we saw in the videos before, we have geothermal, two-way district heating, uh, using data centers uh, that have a lot of uh, waste uh, heat 
uh, etc. So a lot of new technologies that can be combined and utilized uh, together to provide heating for cities and smaller settlements also. And the most important thing on this slide is probably uh, the energy efficiency curve, the green one. You can see that uh, it's uh, newer systems have higher energy efficiency. And that's mostly because of the what you see on the red curve, that uh, the water temperature <clears throat> uh, is much lower uh, in the newer generation systems because uh, it's uh, combined with uh, a lot of energy efficiency measures, is combined with uh, using local waste en um, energy, etc. And this will be important for the next part of the presentation, which is uh, of, about the analysis we prepared for Tuzla I, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I don't think it's published uh, yet, uh, but it's finished almost. Uh, the current situation there is it, it's one of the cities that ha already has a really developed district heating network in uh, in the western balkans uh, it's uh, the situation there is that you, one of the units on, of the coal fire power plant is providing also heat to tuzla but also the nearby town lukavats uh, the district heating part is managed by a public utility company uh, it has a huge network the entire network uh, length i think is something like 170 kilometers it has 20, almost 23,000 us users, that's household and businesses also. Uh, and I think that's something like 80% of the total number of users in the Tuzla region, uh, which is quite high compared to other uh, cities in the Balkans. Uh, the tech, I, I won't bother you with uh, too many technical uh, details about the system. Uh, but as you can see on the slide, the flow temperature is 130 degrees. Uh, and uh, I don't have it here. The return temperature is 60 degrees. So we have a lot of heat that is lost in the network itself uh, because it's based on this older second generation systems. Uh, the problem here is mostly, be, uh, well, not the problem, but uh, the plan in Tuzla by the national and local authorities is to close Unit 4 before 2023 because that's one of the obligations that the country has towards the European Union and the energy community. Uh, but what they're planning to do is to replace it with a new Unit 7 and instead of switching to renewable options, at least, at least partially. Um, in one of the sorry in one of the uh, uh, progress reports from the European Union this was uh, highlighted as one of the steps in the wrong direction that the country is taking uh, by in, in this analysis a lot of options were uh, considered uh, it, it was uh, what was most financially feasible and uh, what was Best for the environment, for climate uh, mitigation, etc. Uh, and uh, the end result is that uh, the it is uh, the end result. Sorry, is that uh, um, it is technically possible for the city to fully replace local use of coal by solar energy, both for electricity and uh, heat production. Uh, but this uh, solution will require massive improvement of energy efficiency, uh, use of efficiency, use of heat in the buildings, some transformation of the heat grid to low temperature grids, uh, fourth generation uh, uh, district heating grid that uh, can that will also be uh, supported by heat pumps. Uh, it requires a lot of time to be implemented, a lot of investments, of course, 
and it requires involvement from the local government and the, um, and of course individuals house owners uh, it is one of the recommendations is also to use um, to make a geological study which is yet to be done uh, which identifies uh, which can identify sufficient uh, subsurface storage capacities uh, for for heat and um, because this requires like i said a lot of time and uh, a lot of interventions in the network in order to um, kind of avoid some of these uncertainties, uh, uncertainties um, one of the recommendations is to have biomass cogeneration that can be used for transition period and also another option was to connect the heating grid to the already existing unit six of the power plant uh, not really recommended but it is a economically feasible option that can also be used for the transition period uh, in the analysis the newly planned unit seven and also waste incineration were analyzed for comparison and uh, the result was that they are not economically feasible at all for the region. And continued firing of coal in the new unit, and uh, of course, it's not uh, it's not recommended from an environmental point of view. Uh, in theory, this is really important that in theory, the entire planning and transition period can be completed before. 2030, but only if it started this year. And I think we saw that in the videos before that uh, the whole uh, the projects are both in uh, Munich and Helsinki were between seven and uh, ten years old. If I'm uh, seven and ten years uh, needed for planning and financing and permitting, etc. So it, it's a long period. So it's really if if we are going to transition to renewable energy in the district heating uh, uh, area, we really need to start right now. Uh, and the next step we are taking is we are preparing same analysis for Plevlia, Montenegro. That's the home of the only coal-fired power plant in the country. And right now, the current plan they have is from 1982 to convert the power plant to cogeneration, uh, which we want to give recommendations for four generation heating solutions because we want to avoid further co use for heating. Uh, there will be meetings with municipalities, municipalities both in Tuzla and Plevlia probably this autumn. Uh, so, yeah, uh, usually what the how the planning process should be is that you stop start with the newest technologies possible and then if they're not feasible for any reason then you roll back to some of the older technologies but here we see in the balkans uh, this uh, uh, way of operation of the of the governments that they are sticking to old plans before uh, with old plans and old technologies instead of considering newer technologies. And this is the uh, case with uh, Plevlia, exactly. <clears throat> uh, for the end, I will give some general recommendations. Uh, so the country needs to have a clear strategy that will enable the transformation of heating systems. Uh, it, it has to be done uh, on time. Uh, otherwise, it will cause delays. Uh, it will trap the countries in uh, another transition periods. Like uh, in, in the Western Balkans, we have countries that are now planning to, to create, to build new gas-fired cogeneration plants. And uh, that might not be the best solution right now because we already have better technologies. Uh, the, munis the municipalities must take the initiative here they have to build the cap capacities they can create heat mapping as a basic preparation and they need to start planning right now uh, there are already some successful cases we, was, we already saw some of them on the videos uh, we need to build on them to to identify challenges based on already those good practices that people that other countries have and uh, 
rely on already available financing mechanisms. And this is really important because this is a long process and reliable financing is important here. Uh, some of the development banks and also the European Commission, they have uh, a, a lot of funds available for uh, for these kinds of four generation uh, heating technologies. Uh, and probably the most important is that this is essential for the decarbonization by 2050 commitment. So yeah, it needs to start right now because it will take years to be implemented. And I think I am done with that. So, um, so thank you. Thank you, Darren. You can stop your screen sharing. And uh, thank you for the presentation. It was it was really interesting for me. Uh, and I, for the public, now we are going to continue with another presentation from uh, Philip uh, uh, from Philip Vilga. Uh, Philip uh, is um, from Friends of the Earth uh, Slovakia, Priatelia Zeme, and it's really interesting that uh, Slovakia is the most is one of the most exemplary cases of co phase out in our region, and uh, I think till to 2023, they are going to uh, end the use of uh, coal in their systems. And um, now we're going to hear from him about the uh, uh, district heating uh, system transition uh, in, uh, in Slovakia. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, uh, it's going to be really interesting for everyone. Uh, just um, I want to uh, add one more thing. You can uh, ask your question in the question and uh, in the chat section. And uh, we're going to have a short Q&A section after the end of the first session. So uh, thank you all for that. Uh, Philip, now I'm giving you the stage. You can share your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for, for your words. Okay, I'm gonna try to, to share the screen. Uh, wait a second, you probably see it, but I can see it. Too many folders opened. <laughs> uh, all right. Can you see it in the presenting mode? Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay, so uh, as Svetoslav said, my name is Philip Vilga. I'm an energy consultant in Friends of the Earth, SEPA. I'm not a campaigner, so maybe the you know, I'm more a technician than, than a campaigner. So uh, probably it's going to be, uh, I, I, I try to do it not a lot of uh, technical, but maybe some words from my mouth is going to be like that. So sorry for that. Uh, yeah, uh, I will. I will very briefly introduce you the, the current state of the district heating in the Upper Nitra region. That's the region where actually um, I'm working uh, on, on on district heating systems. Uh, there is a there is a CHP coal plant Novaki operating currently, but it stops its operation in 2023. As, as Svetoslav said, uh, we have only two. I think two. Uh, coal plants uh, operating right now, and they are about to to end their their operation. And, and as I said, this uh, Novaki plant is gonna end in 2023, and I think the Boyani, the other plant, is gonna uh, end even uh, sooner. So uh, this is already agreed. This uh, this this uh, that's the Novaki CHP plant is gonna uh, stops <coughs> stops. Uh, and the heating then will be provided by a uh, company uh, PTH, which has won a competition with another company. Uh, the winning proposal by PTH uh, was slightly better, even from our perspective, mainly because the company is part partially owned by municipality, which gives some sort of uh, decisions to the to the hands of people, and also that the HBP company. 
the minor owner of PTH. The, the municipality is the uh, mayor, mayor owner and the HBP company is the minor owner of PTH. Uh, and also this HBP is a local mining company, but they have uh, some experience in renewable projects. It's quite uh, weird maybe to, to hear that, but they have. Uh, despite of the fact that in upcoming project, uh, there is a deployment of renewables, uh, it's still mainly based on gas and biomass combustion, which we cannot agree with. Uh, that's, that's why, that's the reason uh, why, we, why we managed to sign a memorandum uh, with PTH company, where we clarified that the project will be rediscussed uh, after a certain time. So we kind of consider this as a just first phase. And even in Slovak action plan, uh, our commitments that uh, district um, heating stakeholders will be reducing energy needs uh, in buildings and distribution systems, increasing the share of renewables, replacing fossil gas, and increasing the use of energy facilities owned by citizens. So uh, this is the reason why we, why we as I said, uh, this mentioned project we consider just as a first temporary phase of this reheating. We have the memorandum. And we fully work on planning the second phase project in which we would like to see a huge development of these rating systems uh, towards to, uh, as, as, as that was said, uh, fourth generation of this reheating. Uh, yeah, this is, I think, a well known graph for you. Uh, even that uh, has, has shown it. Uh, you can see the development of these rating systems here. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna uh, describing it uh, in general. I'm gonna try to accustom it to to our case. Uh, the days we are in between 2G and 3G in Upper Nitra region. Uh, as I said, we use uh, very hot pressurized water from uh, Novaki CHP plant. Uh, uh, it's it's actually a, a lignite a, a brown coal there, uh, and also it it is the 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 hot pressurized water is led uh, to the quite distant places. Uh, which means uh, which means that uh, there's a, a lot of uh, heat losses in pipes. The first phase uh, that's the project by the by the PTH uh, company will be more or less a 3G. Uh, the temperature of water will be lower since it will be divided into three zones. It's not going to be like a, a one huge central centralized plant. Uh, leading the heat to the to the uh, to all towns around, but uh, it's going to be like three zones. That means we will not need such high temperature to cover heat loss uh, made by distance, but still there will be uh, uh, the sources will be gas boilers, uh, also biomass boiler. Uh, metering and more monitoring is not going to be developed uh, anyhow, and also parts of old pipes uh, are, are going to remain, uh, which are or which I, I consider all uh, as a feature of lower generation system than, than 3G. Uh, our goal, as I said, uh, is 4G, uh, which you can see on the right. Um, it uses a lot of mainly renewables. Um, it uses kind of like st all strengths of renewables. That's why there is more sources than one. It's not, uh, I, I don't call it anymore like centralized. Uh, district heating, but decentralized heat, district heating with all uh, with with a lot of uh, decentralized uh, heat sources working all together. Uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not going uh, to talk in general here. I, I will show you the potential for G uh, district heating uh, uh, in in this slide. Uh, yeah, in this slide. Okay. Uh, since a lot of sources uh, can be connected to the four G district heating. It can have uh, many forms depending on available sources. Here you can see the scheme, um, which is not a real system, but it rather shows uh, uh, a, a potential of sources in the region. 4G district heating operates with lowered flow temperature, but in order to it, in order to have a working system with such temperature of water, reduced energy demand must happen, which means proper building and pipe refurbishment. Uh, I'll talk more about uh, our specific topic at uh, our specific work at this topic, uh, lowering the heat demand uh, in upcoming slide. But but back to the system. Uh, the system itself is based mainly on renewables, but it's a huge advantage from from my perspective is that even when you do not have enough capacity of cleaner sources in the grid, you can temporarily use, for example, gas 
of biomass or any older technology until you add more renewable sources to the system and replace the temporary ones. Uh, this is this is a huge thing because you know like uh, you ha you have something to to persuade uh, the stakeholders there that that uh, they can do it actually right now they can start uh, slowly to uh, implementing uh, renewables to the system. Uh, renewables, uh, as you as you as as we all know, uh, are less stable during the year since the sun is not shining all the time and so on. Uh, thus. Uh, proper seasonal and also day-to-day -day accumulation is needed. Uh, in such systems, uh, also synergies uh, are, synergies with other energy sectors are very important, mainly power sector. Um, as, as it was said uh, during those videos at the beginning, uh, because heat pumps are gonna be an essential part of such systems. Uh, we would also like to see prosumers here. Uh, those are consumers who do not uh, just take heat from the grid, but also in case of its surplus, uh, provide the heat to the grid. And of course, to end up with a description of, of the solution, the smart controlling is needed, which will be extremely important since there is more sources linked together and they have to work as one. Uh, the grid itself, thanks to lowered flow temperature, even allows to connect future energy sources, such as heat from data centers, or from a centralized district cooling plant, if, if it is a thing in the future. Uh, once again, this picture is not a real, real scheme of how the system will look like or how we want to have it. It just sh shows uh, the potential of the region. Uh, as I said before, we currently work mainly on activities related to heat demand reduction, since it, it is absolutely necessary uh, if you want to have a lowered flow temperature in this rheetic system. You cannot use uh, the lower temperature, uh, the temperature around 60, 70 degrees, uh, with the uh, current state of buildings. You know, if, if you don't have if you don't have a properly refurbished building, you cannot use uh, lower temperature, and this is this is the obstacle. Uh, we have already made a study about the potential of lowering uh, heat demand in building in the biggest town of the region called Previza, where we have performed quite a big survey and terrain work. Uh, results of the study have shown that if the most optimistic scenario is applied to the heat consumption, uh, is applied, the heat consumption can be can be lowered by by uh, 62 percent. Uh, I must say that the potential of this study was calculated just for the construction refurbishment uh, and not the piping system inside of building or from the building to the first heating station. Uh, there are some old systems with four pi four pipes where heat exchanger station is out of building and it's very uneconomical. A lot of uh, heat uh, is, uh, is lost uh, on, on the way to the building. Um, so altogether, uh, I mean, if, if there was an estimation about, about these this systems, these old heating, uh, heat exchanger stations, and there's an estimation that some buildings with this old system can save approximately another 40%. Uh, so altogether, it can be a, a huge, uh, a huge uh, heat uh, heat loss reduction, and just just from this uh, building perspective. Then the, uh, you have like outer uh, distribution grid. Currently, we are working on on study uh, about this topic. Uh, it's quite hard to get, uh, especially it's hard to 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 get data because uh, this is something you have to cooperate. Uh, with uh, heat suppliers uh, who either don't have the data or they just don't want to provide you that because uh, it's against their uh, their business. So it's it's kind of uh, reasonable from their side, but it's 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 not good uh, good for the future. Um, in the in the region before the first phase project was chosen, there was a study made by Jasper. Jasper, probably you know that is is a uh, technical assistance facility. Uh, of uh, European Investment Bank, uh, which analyzed that there was potential 14% of heat loss reduction in Previsa grid, that's the biggest distribution grid in the region. Uh, I must say from my perspective and from my uh, uh, current work and from the data I have managed to collect and process so far in the, in the mentioned study, the percentage will be definitely higher. Uh, what is sure for now is that winning project of the first phase 
uh, by PTH, we will divide grid to the three parts, as I said, three zones, uh, separate, separate three zones. Uh, it has a big backbone uh, with length of 12 kilometers connecting CHP plant Novaki with the biggest town Previsa will stop operating and it will save another 12% uh, of heat. Uh, simul simultaneously with the heat demand reduction, we are looking into production side two. We are about to publish our study about uh, geothermal uh, potential in the region, um, maybe in a, in a week. Uh, it's already in a final commenting, uh, commenting phase. Uh, basically, we are looking uh, to, uh, to potential geother geothermal and mining water, mainly by, by its indirect use via uh, heat pumps. The study also contains the potential of mine water, uh, of, of, of mine, mine storage, but that's uh, hard to quantify exactly since we, we don't have uh, all the data and also the calculation of such things is extremely difficult. It's not a day-to-day -day accumulation, it's a seasonal accumulation. And uh, from the uh, mathematical perspective, it's, it's really, really difficult to, uh, to calculate such thing. Um, another study uh, should be about solar harvest and other renewable technologies in the region. It will contain not just uh, solar collectors, but as you know, if um, HPs, if heat, heat pumps are implemented in this heating system, you need to have a clean electricity too to power them. Uh, so we investigate even options for renewables for electricity production in the region uh, in, 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 in this following study. After we finish, uh, after we finish um, these studies, uh, we would like to summarize all, uh, all outcomes of each study and make a preliminary design of 4 g rating system in the region. This kind of project should be an annual thing. Uh, it means that every year we would uh, we would upgrade form a version of the study since uh, every year new inputs and, and facts uh, come. And in the last uh, slide, I would like to show you uh, some of our plans for the future related to the to the heating or related to the topics I, I, I have described before. We have to continue with the reduction of heat demand since it's absolutely crucial. I always uh, repeat this, that the uh, heat demand is the, is the key to 4G system because you need to have uh, really well refurbished buildings. Otherwise, you cannot use uh, lower temperature. Um, as I said, uh, this, uh, we, we are, I mean, uh, for buildings, we are planning to, to create um, a roadmap uh, to help the, the municipalities how to refurbish the buildings. Uh, in a logical and feasible way, because uh, it's really chaotic in Slovakia, and I think it's it's uh, uh, almost everywhere that uh, there is not a not a plan uh, how to how to refurbish uh, uh, buildings, and uh, even from the uh, architectural uh, perspective, it's it's then then it it, it looks like like uh, it's it's not quite quite good to see. Uh, we would also like to look deeper into some building uh, which we. Which, which has uh, refurbished its uh, piping system uh, inside. And uh, we would like to uh, have it as a good pilot project. We actually already, uh, I mean, two weeks ago, we found uh, one, one building, uh, one such building. So we are happy that uh, we will make some, some, some paper about it too. We will also continue with our work on geothermal and mining water and other renewables. Uh, we uh, cooperate in this. I wouldn't say that cooperate, but we uh, we are kind of in a in a in a uh, good cooperation with uh, with the HBP with the mining company because they have all the projects uh, and they are like the biggest investor in the in the region. But uh, they kind of um, has they, they kind of have seen already that we can help them because it's already said that uh, the coal is gone and and and. Uh, uh, gas is, is 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 about to be to be to be gone. So uh, they, I must say, they kind of started cooperating with us. Uh, these last three rows uh, is kind of a thing I said before. Uh, it's related to the preliminary feasibility study of 4G, which we'll be upgrading every year. Uh, but of course, to be able to make such comprehensive plans uh, as a supply or heat management plan, we will need a lot of relevant data. And this is the biggest problem, uh, actually, for me to, to get the data. 
and uh, I want to emphasize this that it will not be done immediately. This this uh, 4G distributing systems of or planning that and even implementing that is a long long term thing. So uh, yeah, probably that's that's all from my side, and uh, I, I I thank you for the for that for your attention. Uh, thank you, thank you, Philip, for your presentation. Uh, again, I want to say that uh, whoever have some questions, just type them in the chat and we're going to answer them in our Q&A session at the end of the panel. Now I want to um, give the stage uh, to uh, Judy uh, and with uh, Peter. They are going to say uh, to present some policy recommendation from Germany in how we can transform the district uh, district heating networks and how maybe we can push our own municipalities in uh, in doing this transition. So the stage is yours. So I hope you can see the slides now. Yes, we can okay. see them. Thank you very much, Svatoslav, for the invitation and the possibility to present our recommendations regarding district heating in Germany. Um, Peter and I work at um, um, Environmental Action Germany. This is a German NGO dealing with environmental and nature protection issues, and as well as consumer protection issues. Uh, our interests our interests are broad, clean air as well as recycling or environmental justice. And a big theme is um, energy supply and climate protection. And besides other energy themes like coal and gas phase out, um, we um, deal as well with the decarbonization of district heating systems in Germany which is quite a new theme in the German NGO scene. Um, in Germany, about 9% of the annual heating demand is supplied via district heating systems. Um, this, is about, this is an amount of about 125 terawatt hours. 14% um, of all households are connected to a district heating network. Um, um, the, the share is uh, a little bit higher in the eastern part of Germany than in the western part. Altogether, we have about 1,200 heating networks in Germany. And they have different sizes, um, small networks with about 20 houses, up to the really uh, big networks in the cities of Berlin, Hamburg, or Munich. What is significant is that um, 80% or oh, that in Germany, um, district heating clearly predominates in rental apartments. 80% of the customers are tenants. Uh, this figure shows um, the ownership structure of different um, European countries of Poland, Germany, Sweden, and Denmark. The second column is Germany. And as we can see, uh, three quarters of um, the district heating companies in Germany are owned, uh, are privately owned. This is a green, um, the green part of the column. Um, this is a quite high share in comparison to the other countries. And we can state that in Germany, the district heating market is uh, clearly dominated by private um, profit-driven companies. Um, here you can see the district heating sources we have in Germany. And the numbers are from 2018, but um, there are only slight uh, differences um, to the numbers we have today. 
So, um, the, the dominating source is fossil gas followed by coal, here divided into hard coal and lignite. And um, only 1% of the sources don't require um, fuels. Um, it's 1% on, on top of the column and it mainly comes from geothermal energy. The share of um, renewable energy is about 21%, but as you can see, um, the main part of it comes from biomass and organic waste incineration, which is um, connected with some problems as we have already heard, because um, biomass isn't carbon neutral uh, in the short term, and there are problems with uh, sustainability standards. Um, the small share of uh, renewable heat is strongly connected to the high share of heat from CHP plants, which is about 72%. Um, we come back to this fact later because it's quite important. What worries is that we can't see um, fundamental changes um, in this distribution in the near future. The only thing what happens at the moment in Germany is that uh, networks supplied um, by coal change to fossil gas, but there's no movement um, to renewable heat. Um, for a publication, we collected the renewable heat potential in Germany last year, and the main understanding was that there uh, are enough sources to meet the demand. But of course, it's not always easy to unlock the potential. The heat demand in Germany at the moment is about 1,300 terawatt hours, but we hope to reduce it um, up to 740 terawatt hours. Um, of course, uh, this needs a lot of buildings renovation. But then the renewable potential uh, really is sufficient and together with surplus heat, it should be possible to uh, build up a climate friendly, uh, to, to build up climate friendly district heating networks. So then what's the problem? We have enough, enough potential, we have our climate goals, but there's no movement towards um, renewable district heating in Germany. And so we dived into laws and directives and regulations um, to find out what the ob obstacles are. So the first obstacle we find out are the missing subsidies for renewable heat. Um, in Germany, there are no direct subsidies for renewable heat. The only possibility to get subsidies um, for renewable heat is um, an indirect way via subsidies for CHP plants. And this is a bit, little bit complicated, but I try to uh, explain it. In Germany, we have the combined, combined Heat and Power Act, which offers operating subsidies for CHP plants. Um, it is paid for each kilowatt hour electricity generated. So in this combined heat and power act, there is uh, one possibility to get subsidies for renewable heat um, and the operator gets it if the renewable heat feeds into the same system like the CHP heat. And then the CHP plant receives an extra bonus paid per kilowatt hour of electricity produced. Um, please note, it's the bonus paid for renewable heat is paid on fossil CHP electricity. So the fact is that to get the money for renewable heat, um, it's necessary to produce fossil electricity and heat. And I think it's, it's clear that such a system will never lead to high shares of renewable heat. So our first recommendation is to um, to offer subsidies for renewable heat um, on a direct way and not via um, CHP funding. Um, 
Okay, the next obstacles um, will be presented by Peter. So hello all together. I hope everybody can see the sh the share now. Is it the case? I can see it. Okay, fine. It's not on the big monitor, so I have to look at the small monitor. Okay. Uh, hello all together. And now I will continue what uh, Judith starts with the obstacle two, the subsidies for fossil heat. Uh, in um, Germany, it's paid a basic bonus for each electrical kilowatt hour, uh, which is produced by a CHP plant. And it's also paid a one-off bonus for switching from coal to other fuels with the idea to reduce CO2 emissions. There is also paid a uh, payment for avoided grid charges. And all these things together together lead to total subsidies from 1,400 to 3,700 euros per installed kilo for each installed kilowatt. So this is a lot of uh, uh, subsidies. And uh, so there is economically no chance for renewable heat. This is a problem. And uh, this uh, is the reason what Judith already says that there are so, lot, so much uh, fossil driven CHP plants in Germany and uh, not uh, the renewable heat uh, isn't really used until today. So our recommendation too is our subsidies for fossil to stop all subsidies for fossil heat, particularly for fossil CHP plants must be abolished in order to end the economic disadvantage of green heat. But what has to be done to come to more renewables. Um, the obstacle three is that CHP prevents the use of renewable heat as we already noticed because of the high subsidies on CHP powers. And so the production of high shares of fossil CHP heat. Everybody who wants to earn some money with his, with his turbines has to produce power. And it doesn't matter if you use the heat or not, or is it produced at the same time where it is needed. So some guys come to the idea to build and power to heat storage, but, but this uh, storage won't solve the problem because the fossil, it is only storage fossil heat. And uh, this one competes with renewable heat, which of course uh, causes much more costs than the power to heat storage from fossil fuels. This is also a problem and it uh, prolongs the life from CH from fossil driven CHP power plants and uh, but doesn't solve the problem. So we recommend the generation of electricity and heat should generally be separated that there is no uh, 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 problems to, to define what is needed and what is not needed. Uh, cause in a system with a higher share of renewable energies, the CHP plants are running less or less, more, more or less. Uh, the full load hours are reduced, are uh, going down already now from 3,000 hours up to 2,000 hours, and they will go down further on in the next time if more renewable come to the place and produce electricity. And uh, the share of electricity now is between 30 and 80 percent. It uh, depends on the, uh, on the sun and the wind and uh, from the consumption. But there is another obstacle which we have uh, found. Uh, the 
in electricity, the efficiency electricity directive defines CHP is highly efficient. And this allows to get massive subsidies based on this definition. And also the state aid guidelines, which are uh, binding for all European countries, are following this definition. But um, the highly efficient, the definition in the ED means only high efficiency is when and CHP is more than 10% more efficient than the divided production from heat and power. But heat networks, and Philip already told it, uh, the losses in heat networks are more than 10%. So it's not really highly efficiency. And also the flexibility uh, reduces the efficiency of CHP if there is only needed one of the energy need it's only needed heat or it's only needed electricity. So this should be taken into account by the support. And another point is that uh, highly efficiency or the, the, the definition uh, is only comparing the same fuels. And this doesn't work because there are an example which I will tell to you. It's uh, re uh, using renewable energies. Uh, there's much more efficiency than comparing the same fuels, gas to gas or coal to coal. This doesn't work and this is not, this is fallen out of time. Um, efficiency, what does it mean? If you have a CHP and an input from 100 kilowatt hours, you can make roughly 90 kilowatt hours energy and heat from these 100 kilowatt hours with a with an CHP um, uh, uh, machine. But if you use a, a normal um, combined circle gas power plant uh, combined with heat pump, you get more than 100 kilowatt hours maybe 120 kilowatt hours from the same input on 100 kilowatt hours natural gas. So that means it is better to produce only electricity with a high efficient gas turbine and using a heat pump, which is also using uh, environmental heat and uh, at the efficiency from this system is much more, is much more higher than a normal CHP system with only an CHP uh, turbine is, uh, is, is, can, can deliver. So this uh, comparison from the, from the state aid guidelines doesn't work for introducing renewable energies. So CHP should not longer be classified as a highly efficiency technology, but renewable system deliver greater efficiency. Obstacle five. It's very important to plan what can happen and what is sensible and municipalities should be required to plan heating system in line with clean climate targets. This is a point the, that the public discussion to all these uh, change needed changes are not really in, uh, in the region uh, uh, existing. So nobody exactly knows what uh, kind of uh, consumption of heat is uh, working in the town already Philip mentioned this and it's not also not really known which region is good for uh, for district heating and in which region region district heating may not work optimal so it's better to use an individual house heating so this should be cleared and uh, only Baden-Württemberg is uh, had, has obliged his um, the, the community the municipalities to make a plan and they are making a lot of experience what different and how difficult this is and how much time it, it takes to get all people on board and to, to come to a common um, sense of, uh, of, uh, of, of changing also heat to renewable heat. Obstacle six. It's another point which uh, we already noticed from the electricity grid that uh, for 10 or for 20 years, uh, the liberalization from the grid leads to an owner to a, to a grid and to the dividing from grid and uh, production from electricity. 
and therefore it was possible for renewable uh, energies to go even in this grid and uh, it is not discriminating and uh, therefore it was a very fundamental uh, uh, cause and uh, fundamental point to come to a uh, good production from renewable. This up to now hasn't happened into the heat grid. The heat grid normally is owned by the by the grid operator and he's also delivering the heat, but he has no interest to come or to get in renewable heat or waste heat or whatever and to reduce the CO2 emission from the heat grid. And also consumers, consumers can't change the provider with a higher share of renewable, whatever. The market um, forces cannot work in the system as it is driven up to now. So, as I already mentioned, this could, the heat generation and heat network should be unbundled and government should provide real third party access to heating grid, just like it is in the meantime, uh, given in the electricity grids. Now at the end, let me give you a short summary. Laws, directives, subsidies, they, they hinder renewable heat. So we have some recommendation to stop the subsidies for renewable instead of fossil heat, to remove the off the CHP definition highly efficient, because it isn't really highly efficient, and the heat system planning at the municipal level should start at once because it lasts and is complicated and it should also be able it should also be able to facilitate third party access to the grid for to get in waste energy and of course renewable energies from solar from environmental heat and from geothermal just like the first presenter told us that's our short um, input. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Judith and uh, Peter, for your presentation. We're just going to uh, continue with uh, our uh, colleague, uh, colleague Gennady Kondarev, who is going to give us a short, short opinion of how uh, we could uh, change the district heating system in Sofia. Thank you very much, Svetoslav. Uh, and I want to thank all the presenters for the fantastic presentations. It has been an extremely comprehensive panel. It really draws up the challenges that we that lay in front of us, um, underlying the importance of how, it, uh, how important it is to basically do the energy transition in the district heating networks because the potential of the district heating networks to be balancing the use of energy in a very efficient way and be uh, able to provide more cost efficient heating storage, um, allow uh, the future uh, decentralized uh, energy production of heat to happen in the urban areas. This is a huge amount of efficiency that is laying in front of us and that we could tap in uh, to, to this potential. Now, um, the idea was that uh, with uh, the colleagues from Zazemiata, we try to draw a little bit uh, uh, more on the topic of how maybe a large district heating network, like the district heating of Sofia, can actually do the transition. We are very much in the beginning of, uh, of this work and conceptualizing uh, actually what can be done. And I think that uh, uh, the colleagues from Bankwatch have done already a fantastic job in the regions that they focus, mapping the, all the opportunities and educating uh, all of us here in the C and the SEE region on um, uh, what uh, third and fourth generation, generation of district heating is, what could be the projects that can uh, pilot and show us the way ahead uh, how quickly can this transition happen, why we should not aim for a silver bullet solution, because it's not like replacing one source of heat with one single new type of, uh, of heating source, but it's usually, um, as with the renewables in the power sector, a mix of solutions that we need to count on. Um, and it's really not... Uh, um, 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 probably to the uh, to the concept that this this transition could be very expensive or impossible. I think these are um, on the topic that it's expensive. Uh, um, I think we should really uh, in the region stop repeating this um, 
this argument because there are no such arguments when our countries are actually still aiming to develop so much uh, over ex super expensive uh, gas capacities or, or even nuclear power projects that uh, drain the money in the region uh, year after year um, and, uh, and continue to be the, the, the wrong solution. Um, one thing that we need to, to also recall is uh, um, the rules under the energy efficiency directive, because we are really supposed to, to um, turn our utilities into providers of energy services, not only of energy. And I think that all the successful concepts in the future are basically uh, aiming towards this direction. At the moment, the situation with Sofia district heating is that the only new thing, and it's really scaring most of uh, most of the people in this city, is turning part of the existing gas capacity because it's a, it's a, um, fully based on gas district heating, turning part of this capacity into waste incineration capacity, which is, in no doubt, uh, a, a very um, false decision and way ahead. This is unfortunately an attempt that is being done also in other smaller district heating networks. Um, there are attempts to also uh, coincinerate or burn biomass at large quantities, which also competes the use of biomass uh, for, um, uh, you know, final consumers that actually would even in the near future not, uh, won't have uh, much other choice uh, but use local biomass because this is the situation in certain rural areas and areas that cannot be uh, connected uh, any time uh, soon to district heating network. Um, uh, something that uh, we've heard as an argument in the uh, in the last year is uh, that it is an issue that uh, EU money are not available for district heating networks. I think this is a very wrong perception that we've heard from the Bulgarian authorities. There is a reluctancy to use European money for networks and for producers that use fossil gas. This is the definition or any type of fossil fuels. But if there is a plan to turn um, a, a district heating network into at least partly using renewable uh, energies uh, and not locking in solutions uh, that, are, uh, that could then require U-turn, then definitely uh, the, the, the pot for the, European, for the use of European funds and the use of uh, recovery money is there and it could be considered. I think that it has been largely um, here an expectation that a plan should just arrive from somewhere and this is not going to happen. We need to start developing these solutions here. I think there is plenty of, of inspiration from uh, the examples that we saw. I think that also the uh, colleagues from uh, Deutsche Umwelthilfe has showed us a very nice structure of what a policy uh, should look like and what should uh, what it shouldn't look like. Um, in in Sofia, I uh, also believe that uh, it is extremely important, basically, to start piloting different solutions. It could be because at the moment uh, we have big centralized capacities that are providing the heat for the district heating network, but it could be a solution that is actually you know, cutting a neighborhood by neighborhood from this uh, fossil uh, fuel, um, uh, from fossil fuel uh, uh, district heating network, and then turning them as pilot projects uh, that use various options for, uh, for renewable energies. This could be the way ahead and only then scaling up uh, this, uh, um, this, um, uh, this solutions uh, aiming to, to tackle the entire city. Uh, we saw that, um, when it comes to the use of heat pumps, even uh, a city so north and, and, and that is in such a cold area like Helsinki uh, is planning to use uh, heat pumps as a solution uh, for, uh, for their heating need. Um, Sofia is definitely in a way better position uh, to use various such sources. Um, uh, including, you know, uh, heat pumps, including the option to use solar energy for solar thermal, not, uh, not for, for solar electricity in this case, because the district heating company does still own large plots of industrialized areas. And solar in this case can actually be 
uh, uh, be deployed in various ways. It could be large industrial scale of, sol of solar uh, that can um, be auxiliary source for heat in this, uh, in this heating network. It could also be uh, decentralized because um, there was already a project in Sofia that I was involved in more than five years ago called Staccato. It was developed already um, under the um, sixth framework program of the EU and it installed thermo, thermo, solar thermal capacities on the rooftops of residential buildings. Then the, the heat was stored in large water tanks in the basements and used in combination with the district heatings. Only this was providing uh, roughly about 50% of, uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, cutting the use of, uh, of energy provided from the district heating for the domestic hot water. It was not for, for heating in this case, but it could be uh, deployed in this way. And of course, um, a district heating network, which is fourth generation, would allow any excess heat from such systems uh, around the year to be uh, to be also fed back into the uh, into the network of pipelines and used in an in an even more efficient way because this problem was encountering already back then uh, one major uh, technological issue at some points um, in the system um, there was so much heat uh, especially in the summer season that uh, this was turning into an issue for the district heating network because. Uh, they didn't know if it's actually involuntarily feeding in uh, back some energy into their network and how this affects their uh, measurement instruments. Um, geothermal, and I would be a bit speculative here uh, because there have been a bit of talk over the years and a massive quantity of rumors that geothermal, as Sofia is laying uh, on such a place that we also have uh, not bad geothermal uh, potential with uh, hot springs uh, around the the area with uh, um, uh, possibly uh, not too deep uh, relatively shallow um, uh, potential that can be tapped uh, for the use of uh, in the district heating network um, there has been a lot of speculation over the years if uh, uh, that there have been actually attempts to consider this uh, from what we hear from politicians in Bulgaria when it comes, you know, to geothermal and Sofia district heating is, you know, this is a municipal issue. We, we cannot deal with it. It has to be Sofia municipality to be, uh, in, uh, to, to get involved in, in such talks. And I think that this is a little bit, um, uh, um, it's a little bit, um, unacceptable to leave it fully uh, for for the local governments uh, uh, to, uh, for such a big district heating because one of the issues even for the power grid in Bulgaria is the fact that we have a winter peak the winter peak in the use of electricity for example is because we use electricity for heating in a relatively inefficient way uh, and this uh, this is why heating is actually key for the solution to basically trim those winter peaks combined with the uh, with uh, proper energy efficiency measures in buildings and measures on the on the uh, provision of heating this is how we can trim this winter peak and uh, allow the system to accommodate way more renewables uh, than it could at the moment because of um, uh, uh, because of their seasonality um, and uh, um, yeah, I think I think these are uh, relatively the matters that are drawing out the picture of of the next steps that can be taken. But Sofia district heating, being such a large network, should not be allowed to be only Sofia issue. It is a national issue because this city combines nearly one fourth of the population in this country. It is. It has a relatively longer winter compared to uh, many other cities. So the one, the, the bigger cities that are in the valleys and um, at the Black Sea side. Uh, so so the 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 use of energy for the heating during the winter is affecting the entire energy consumption of the country. It should be an issue of national matter, and it should be a, a, a subject to national policies as well. It is also a, a, a natural monopoly, like any district heating uh, network and provision. And this is another issue that we should not leave it 
just like this. It's a matter of, of public interest and we should all get involved in the development of the solutions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Gennady. <coughs> now we have a couple of questions uh, from the from the public, and um, I propose to have very short and uh, brief answers to those questions uh, because the uh, second part of our session, uh, the second session, the second part of our day, of the conference today, it's starting. Uh, it's scheduled to start in ten minutes, so we have a question about uh, to to Davor and uh, to Philip, they're more or less the same questions I see. And um, uh, the question starts with an opinion that uh, the percentage of fossil gas in the district heating is huge. And uh, are there any plans to phase out uh, fossil gas in district heating systems in the near future in our uh, region? And um, also, uh, fossil fuel it's, um, can be used as a transition fuel, you know, for some transitionary period. And um, what is your basically your opinion? Is there any possibilities to uh, cope out without uh, fossil gas in our uh, district heating systems? That one? I see. I see. Yeah. Uh... So oh, I, uh, I wrote an answer to the question, but I will elaborate a bit more now. Uh, right now, all the energy strategies for, I, I can speak only for the Western Balkan countries. Uh, all of them uh, include new fossil gas infrastructure. So uh, here we are not speaking about uh, um, fossil fuel phase out at all in the Western Balkans. And uh, there is uh, right now, for example, in Macedonia, there is uh, there are three power plants working on fossil gas. One is uh, cogeneration; two are just uh, producing heat. Uh, and the plan is to have uh, at least four more in the next seven years, uh, with installed capacity of almost one thousand megawatts. Uh, which will then be really hard to replace in in the near future. So uh, this is uh, this is a situation when uh, where we uh, we have a huge risk of fossil fuel lock, uh, lockdown for the next two maybe three decades. Uh, I think the situation is same the same with uh, Kosovo, probably with Bosnia. Uh, also, a lot of new gas infrastructure, new interconnections, connection to the transatlantic pipeline, uh, so, transatlantic pipeline. Sorry, uh, and this these are all investments that are uh, in hundreds of millions of euros uh, throughout the region, and it will create a lot of stranded assets uh, in the long term, because if we want to decarbonize completely by 2050, we need to, uh, we don't need new infrastructure that will be operational five or six years from now. So this is the situation in the Western Balkans right now. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, maybe, maybe Philip can share a few, a few words about, about that, what is, what is happening in, in Central Europe. Uh, yeah, I already got the answer. Uh, I mean, um, probably since I'm not a company here, I, I'm a technician, I cannot uh, give you an answer about the whole Central Europe. Maybe it's a question for my colleagues. But I work on, on the specific uh, region of Upper Nitra region. And as I, as I, as I type down there in the answer, uh, uh, the first phase uh, is the project resource, which was already agreed, and it contains gas boilers for the pig loads. Uh, we, we cannot change it, but uh, what we are trying to do uh, is that we are uh, kind of uh, not just uh, pointing out that gas is bad, but we are showing the solutions how to uh, get rid of gas when the time comes. Because uh, I didn't say probably during the presentation, but uh, there is a, a let's say a, a weak point in the solution, and that's that the, there are like older, a bit older uh, biomass boilers, 
uh, which uh, dur durability or the you know, lifespan is going to uh, end in, I don't know, in 12 years. And we want to be prepared in that time that we will have like a, a bunch of solutions how to get rid of gas for forever, let's say. So this is this is our our, our work in the region. And uh, maybe I can say like for Slovakia, mm, I think we are we are second we have second largest uh, gas grid uh, after uh, probably Netherlands. I don't know. So this is a huge thing for Slovakia to get rid of gas because it's 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 everywhere. You can you can connect to to gas grid uh, almost almost everywhere. And yeah, there is there is some mm, let's say. Uh, I, I I don't know. There's some some kind of strategic document from uh, government. They want to change it to to uh, hydrogen or at least to mix hydrogen and biogas to gas. But I I'm not a big fan of this uh, from from the te technical perspective. Uh, but yeah, this is not my focus of work, so I I cannot give you like a like a, a probably answer you 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 want to hear, but. Yeah, from my point of view, uh, I work uh, that in the region, and and I wanna change it. Change. I wanna change what is actually able to be changed. I don't wanna, you know, just point out the problems. I wanna. I, I want to give solutions to the to the to the region. So this is this is our work in the region. Thank you, Philip, for your comprehensive uh, answer. And uh, I have one, one personal question that I would like to ask. And uh, I would like to know what is uh, your opinion. I'm asking all panelists, what is your opinion of uh, the inclusion of uh, biomass in the district heating systems? And is there some future? Because we have a lot of debates um, inside Zazemiata team about that issue. Yeah, I, I guess I can start uh, again. Uh, sorry. sorry about that. Uh, so, yeah, biomass plays a huge role in the heating sector in the Balkans in general. And uh, in most of the countries, if not all of the countries, it's unsustainable use of biomass. So. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, illegal logging uh, in the countries, so we don't even have an exact number of uh, of the percentage of biomass that is used in the heating sector. Uh, and based on this, I would say that we need to work uh, first on ensuring sustainable use of biomass, because it, we have to be realistic. It's impossible to just stop using it. Uh, you have like 80% of the households in some of the countries that are using biomass for household heating. And uh, we need to ensure sustainable use. And when it comes to district heating, uh, we should maybe support use of biomass that is not forest wood uh, in smaller communities to, to um, to roll out some small scale district heating. There was a pilot project uh, in Macedonia in the Kichevo region, uh, but it, it's still just on paper, nothing is happening. But uh, it should use like a uh, waste uh, biomass to, to create heating for like 20, 30 households. And that might be uh, a good solution, but in general, I'm speaking from a bank watch perspective, uh, we don't want to burn anything to produce energy in, in the long term. So it should be phased out in the long term. Perhaps I may follow to Davor. I agree with him. It's only perhaps since uh, maybe allowed to use some small um, uh, district heating uh, plants. In region, region, in regions, and in rural regions where the uh, wood is uh, directly in front, uh, but not, it's not sensible to import biomass just like it is planted in some countries from from uh, from Southern America or Southern uh, Australia. That doesn't make sense. And uh, from the point of uh, 
air pollution, it's, it doesn't also make sense. Even from saving CO2, of course, burning wood uh, leads to a carbon um, uh, uh, lack and uh, carbon gap, and uh, this will be filled up only in 50 to 70 years. So the greater style burning from, from fossil, from biomass, from wood doesn't make sense. Even from waste biomass, uh, it may be allowed in, in, uh, in, in, in central in district, heat, district heating. Yes, uh, I mean, I, can, I just can, uh, oh, Dava and Peter already said the, the right thing. So we, the summary is that we should try to use as less biomass as possible for, for heating and we should prefer other renewable sources. It is it is definitely uh, the, the way that uh, the future mix should be planned when it comes to district heating. There's one more question from our colleague Ivailo Klebarov from Zazemiata, and it's about um, what we do with, uh, uh, with individual houses, uh, what could be recommended, expanding the district heating to uh, or uh, focus rather on individual solutions or local district heating systems. I don't know if any of the guests would like to add something to this very last question because we need to move uh, to move forward but i think it's a matter of economics uh, yeah. uh it's uh there is no uh like a single solution that can be used everywhere it's uh based on the location or what on what is available in the location so if you have a lot of solar radiation uh, power uh, solar plants are uh, an option they can be individual they can be centralized it doesn't matter uh, so there is not like one solution that fits everything and also economic feasibility uh, availability of uh, of different kinds of energy everything uh, comes into play here thank you Dabar. I think we won't have much time to continue with this super interesting panel and debate. We have yet another very interesting panel uh, to, to focus on, uh, and it's focused on the financial options. I'm afraid that today the coffee break simply won't happen. I don't know if Svetoslav is going to agree with me, but I hand over back to him. I think that it's going to be um okay to make a short break and meet in five or six minutes like uh let's meet in six minutes yeah in 10 past and uh we're going to continue with uh, our second panel for the day about uh, financial instruments as gennady mentioned so let's have a very short break and meet in five minutes So 50 past back here, see you all.
Hello again, after this very short break. Firstly, I want to, I want to give uh, the stage to Gennady Kondare for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to continue uh, with the first presentation of the second panel. Thanks, Svetoslav. I just wanted to very briefly um, remind the importance of the next topic. It's about financial schemes, financial instruments, and various business models. Um, this has been uh, a topic that was really slowly taking off in the previous years. There have been a lot of uh, um, stop and goes uh, in, in the process, uh, including the fact that, for example, ESCO instruments and initiatives have been uh, suffocated by the 100% grant schemes that have been distributed uh, around. We have been advocating together with uh, other allies like uh, Habitat for Humanity Bulgaria for the development of uh, various financial instruments that, for, that could support uh, the own contribution of homeowners in the process of renovation and the process of uh, change of the, of the fuel base in houses. Um, basically, we have, because it, there's almost zero number of instruments that are active currently in the Bulgarian market. Probably the situation is not so bad around the region, but here it has been really bad because of the 100% grants in the renovation uh, initiatives. And uh, we have been advocating that there should be at least available something very easy, uh, very simple and comprehensive uh, as financial instruments like um, loan that can be zero interest for a certain number of years, say maybe something close to the, uh, to the um, uh, payback of a certain investment. Uh, in relationship with the economies that it is uh, providing to a household. Uh, usually those, uh, any type of measure, uh, be it uh, a new uh, small scale renewable energy source or an energy efficiency measure, they have payback periods uh, ranging from as, um, as shortly as one year up to seven, eight years, sometimes even 10, 12 years. Uh, but for a certain number of years, these loans can be interest-free. Uh, the, the monthly um, installments uh, for, for these loans can be actually um, uh, really according to uh, the, 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 the amount of the energy saving that is achieved. And I think this would be uh, way, more, um, way more attractive for households it would provide uh, a leverage to basically attract private investments uh, and not be only squeezed into the, to the narrow framework of the public funds that are available at the moment. Uh, also creating a, uh, a definitely a moment of inequality between homeowners because some people will get the 100% funding for, for the investments that they need. Other people are getting nothing we would be able to cover way more people uh, and households uh, if we try to involve financial instruments. I'm very happy that this year we finally um, have a few daring speakers, uh, including uh, people from the World Bank and uh, the Ministry of Regional uh, Development. But uh, this is up to Svetoslav to uh, present us the next speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gennady. Uh, now I'm going to give the stage to Vasil Zlatev, who is uh, representative from the World Bank. And uh, Vasil, uh, you're going to present uh, uh, a topic about the funding opportunities, the funding options for replacement of solid fuel heating appliances, uh, with a focus on uh, Bulgaria and uh, Poland. I'll be really glad to learn uh, more about uh, the existing options. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And thank you for organizing this very useful conference. As you know, residential heating in our region is quite an important topic. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, so I, I've, I've, I've worked with... Um, just one second. Sorry, one second. So I've worked with the World Bank on a uh, number of air quality projects in the European Central uh, Asia region. Just a quick caveat, I, ha I haven't been involved in the Poland project, so my colleagues helped me 
with this presentation. So for Pon, uh, it's not a, uh, a first-hand experience uh, for me. So I'll focus on Bulgarian experiences that the World Bank has had uh, in uh, Bulgaria and Poland in terms of funding of uh, solid fuel heating appliances, replacement of solid fuel heating appliances. Um, just from the start, I'm going to say in Bulgaria, we haven't had a program for funding such uh, appliances, but I will give some um, conclusions from our involvement uh, with uh, Bulgaria in the last more than three years now. So basically the World Bank involvement started, um, I said more than three and a half years ago, and the output was developing the, the two air quality strategic programs for the country. <clears throat> the first one being the National Air Quality Improvement Program, which aims to um, bring into compliance municipalities in Bulgaria that are non-compliant with the PM10 limit values. And the other program is the National Air, Air Pollution Control Program, which is a requirement under the National Emission Settings Directive. And here the objective is to project the, the uh, emissions, national emissions uh, until 2030. And when the, the targets are not met, the, the Bulgaria specific targets, emission targets are not, are not met to propose additional measures in order to meet those targets. And here we talk about five pollutants, uh, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, um, non-methane, uh, volatile organic compounds, PM2.5 and uh, ammonia. The cross-section between the two programs is the residential heating measures because in Bulgaria, the largest source of uh, PM10 emissions comes from residential heating on solid fuels, which includes coal and biomass. Uh, whereas for the successful implementation of the emission seedings, especially for PM2.5 and the non-methane volatile organic compounds in the uh, NAPCP, again, the residential heating measures come to the fore. And they also are the most challenging ones to, to implement because we have thousands of users of residential heating on solid fuels. We have tens of technologies, so it's much more difficult to um, implement such measures. In general, what are the measures? The measures were grouped in three main categories. The first category was uh, regulatory. That had to do with both the quality of, of solid fuels offered on the market, but also maybe the restriction of solid fuel use. Then we had um, measures for fuel change, changing from solid fuel to other fuels, and also uh, equipment change. So updating appliances or changing the type of appliances altogether. These are the, the three basic uh, categories of measures including in both programs. After those programs were drafted, um, the World Bank team came together and we, we put together a technical note that we submitted to the Ministry of, of Environment, where we outlined some of the implementation challenges that we're, we kind of saw in our uh, experience working on those programs, what they might be, what are the bottlenecks. And at the end, we um, came up with this three pillar approach to enable the implementation of these two programs. And it's this three pillar approach is kind of illustrated in this, on this slide. Uh, the end goal, of course, is clean air in compliance with not just the CAFE directive, but the National, the national Emission Seeding Directive. Uh, but the three pillars are uh, on the top, the clear and uh, regulatory framework, so strengthening the regulatory framework, then improving municipal capacity to implement, especially in the, in the implementation of uh, programs to replace solid fuel appliances. So in planning, in depth technical capacity, and for that we suggested a centralized technical support unit that can really assist municipalities with uh, all, all features of a, of a stove replacement program. And of course, the third pillar is funding, uh, availability of funding for, for such a program. In this presentation, I'm gonna focus on this pillar because of the topic of the conference, but I would just like to mention that we, we see these three pillars as interconnected. So they're not separate per se, but they're interconnected. Before we talk about funding uh, a bit more, and as I said in Bulgaria, we don't have a specific funding program, so it would be more of the lessons learned, so to speak, in our engagement in, in Bulgaria and what recommendations we've made to the, to the ministry. So when we talk about funding uh, for residential heating um, measures, there's a few things I would like to uh, put into the context first before I go into the uh, conclusions from our work. 
And this is putting into putting those uh, measures into the context of the evolving provisions of the uh, EU policies for energy, for climate, for air quality. We mentioned a few times biomass. Uh, so here we have we have to manage some trade-offs in this in this work. There's not only synergies with climate and energy and, and, and air quality, but there's some trade-offs as well. And a very prominent trade-off is the use of biomass. Um, the use of biomass in Bulgaria is, is uh, quite high. For example, later when I talk about pollen, their coal is more uh, widely used for energy heating. In Bulgaria, it's biomass. And in terms of climate change, uh, biomass is regarded as a uh, renewable energy source. So uh, it, let's say it has, has positive um, view in climate change policies. However, it's, it's, it's an, it contributes to air pollution, even if biomass is burned in, in, in modern stoves, like design stoves. So this is a trade-off that has to be managed. On the other side, we're seeing more and more in Bulgaria switching to uh, heating on electricity, which and that probably will, will increase in the future as well, which uh, as others mentioned, brings some challenges to the grid and to optimizing demand, electricity demand. And then another kind of uh, trade-off between climate and, and air quality is what, what is what is the status of natural gas? Natural gas is um, less has less emissions of air pollutants um, compared to coal, for example, but it's still a fossil fuel, uh, which kind of goes, might go contrary to the uh, European Green Deal and other, other policies. So these are some uh, key strategic questions that um, have to be thought about. And obviously, our first recommendation is that policymakers and decision makers should be aware of those uh, trade-offs and synergies and those connections, because uh, this is being aware in, in the first place is a step that um, can put these uh, considerations into the planning. And then when we talk about funding, especially public funding, uh, rec we recommend that public funding will be more efficiently spent if air quality and efficiency measures are combined. This not only provides a win-win situation for air quality and climate, but it also uh, make sure that we don't end up with oversized heating equipments, equipment, we don't end up with a uh, larger fuel use than, than needed. Um, also, when, when thinking about funding and criteria, for eligibility criteria for funding, we have to have this consideration to uh, take in, this consideration into account, the foreseeable developments in air quality, climate change, and energy policies especially as I mentioned earlier, the treatment of natural gas and, and biomass and so forth. Of course, the best way to, to uh, uh, ensure a win-win situation for uh, energy, climate and, and air quality is to promote sustainable heating in, in, in residential spaces. And this is a topic that is very much under-researched and I don't think it's just in Bulgaria, but in other, in other countries in the region. And uh, specifically, again, to uh, Bulgaria and to, the, and to strategic programs, there has to be a better integration of uh, the air quality programs that are now national level uh, with other national strategic documents. So we don't end up with strategies for every, little, every, every, every issue, but they're integrated in a, in a more holistic way. Now, when we talk about criteria for stove, stove replacement uh, for public funding, here I'm speaking mainly about public funding, there should be quite careful consideration given to the um, who will be eligible. And I, and I mean both uh, territories, municipalities, or regional uh, or regions, and also households. Um, how, do these, how are these funds allocated? As uh, Gennady said in the introduction, we've been used to the 100% grants, but is that the most efficient way to, do, to uh, allocate funding? So, the best would be that, that uh, priorities for allocating funding complement and strengthen national uh, objectives in terms of air quality, but also climate change and, and energy. And also that perhaps the beneficiaries in, in, in the case of Bulgaria, Bulgaria up until now, the beneficiaries could be municipalities uh, to be given a bit more uh, powers over the forms in which they might want to allocate the funds. So we go away from this 100% grant um, scheme. Looking, looking ahead, uh, looking ahead, we want to see whether the, the now 
operational program 2021-2027 has been negotiated now, looking ahead, we want to see how much, how many stoves might be replaced by this uh, operation program with the funding program and uh, what the gap would be. And we did a very quick uh, estimation. On the first row in this table, we see the number of solid fuel appliances in the municipalities that we consider in the National Air Quality Improvement Program. Those were 28 municipalities. And a quick note that this is 2011 data from the latest census. So this number is definitely not the same uh, in 10 years later. We are waiting for the new uh, census to update this, these figures. And then the other rows are a projected number of solid fuel appliances being replaced under different projects. So the live IV project that takes place in Bulgaria with six participating municipalities and the operation program environment, 2014, 2020. And then the last row, or the one before the last, is the executive number of solid fuel appliances to be replaced by the new operation program environment running until 27. And this is from the third draft of this uh, program. And in the end, you see there's quite a lot of solid fuel appliances remaining. Uh, so we haven't even replaced half of the existing appliances 2011 by 2027. And there's a substantial financial gap uh, that that uh, is missing to replace uh, all, all the appliances and depending on technology and what they'll be replaced with we could reach close to a billion level again i say depending on the technology uh, and why this important is it's important because in the national program of uh, national quality improvement program the goal is to replace all sort of fuel appliances 28 municipalities so you can see that even beyond Operation Program 2021-2027, we might have a long way to go uh, to achieve that goal. Uh, therefore, some supplementary funding uh, is needed for stove replacement specifically is needed. And this could be done either through a, a um, funding program that runs uh, together with the operational program in an integrated way or with a program that it's an addi additional program to the operational program, which uh, which increases complexity a lot, both administratively and operational complexity, because if you have two separate pro programs financing the same things, this always uh, brings some complexity into the process. So to sum up uh, some consideration in terms of funding to, uh, for meeting air quality objectives, um, an important point we, we, we are raising in this, um, not only in this uh, in this uh, report, but also in our engagements throughout, is that this personal of funding alone will not achieve the uh, full replacement of solid fuel appliances in the absence of strong regulations, which either establish low emission zones or restrict the use of certain fuels and appliances. And this is why one of the pillars in this three pillar approach that I, I showed at the beginning is uh, regulations. So there has to be basically a carrot and a stick. Only a carrot or only a stick will not work. Um, then uh, coming back to the point on um, the evolving, evolving policies on European level, we have to consider that what are the eligible, we, we have to be clear in Bulgaria, what are the eligible alternative solar fuel appliances that are not only improving air quality, but also align with European goals, but also with Bulgarian strategies, energy strategy, for example. And as also as Gennady mentioned at the beginning of this panel, um, we've been very used to the 100% grant, but perhaps um, there's, there's, there's good role for financial instruments and economic incentives to encourage better take up of uh, replacement of solid fuel appliances such as tax rebates, uh, loans, either low cost or I mean, low interest or no interest loans and so forth. So these type of uh, instruments have been a little bit disregarded uh, until now, but consideration should be, they should be taken into consideration into planning future funding programs. And of course, uh, from the uh, table that you saw with the remaining number of appliances that will be left even beyond the operational program environment 2021, 2027, uh, strategic decision on, on national level should be, should be taken about the need for this supplementary funding. What are we going to do with these extra stoves? How are they going to be replaced? Through, again, through some funding program or through some other incentives or, or through some regulations? 
but this decision has to be made because the planning has to uh, start as soon as possible. Now move over to Poland where um, um, there's been a lot of work in Poland on, on, on residential heating and um, the bank, the World Bank is uh, almost close, it, it, it is going to be supporting the, the Polish uh, uh, government into implementing their uh, clean air priority program uh, with some assistance, which which is hasn't been finalized yet, it's still in the process of uh, final negotiations. So bear that in mind. I just wanted to say a few words about Poland's clean air priority program, um, just to see. The, and this has been a process in Poland that's been going on for many years, uh, involving both institutions but also civil society, uh, academia. So it's been a long process to reach to where uh, Poland is now. And this Clean Air Priority Program is a 10-year national program that runs until 2029 that puts on the table 24 billion euros, about 24 billion euros for improvement of air quality. And about 60% of that funding is earmarked for subsidies or loans to municipalities or tax reliefs. So in Poland, they do a mix of uh, instruments, you know, funding instruments. And 40% of that funding is, is allocated for loans by commercial banks. I will not go into a lot of detail in, in the program because it's a very big uh, program. I'm just going to say a few things about the funding. Uh, there's a the program focuses on single family buildings because analysis have shown analysis in Poland have shown that these are the buildings that uh, where coal is used the most and where you have the highest emissions from. So you have a cap on the funding for single family building at around 12,000 euro. And then you have two levels of subsidies. You have a basic subsidy for uh, households that earn, let's say, an average amount of salaries. And you have increased subsidies for um, for lower income households. And this is also very important. 100% grant or, 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 or a subsidy per se, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing, but its efficiency can be improved by targeting such subsidies. And in this case, um, in Poland, they, they've done this targeting based on the income level and, uh, and, and, and uh, basically where lower income people get, a, get um, improved support in the subsidy level. Just very quickly about the targets, Abam is gonna mention just a couple of things just to, just to uh, give you the scale of this program. Um, this program doesn't, all, doesn't only uh, finance replacement of uh, heating appliances, it also finances thermal retrofit, which is something that we I talked earlier. The combination between air quality and energy efficiency measures is, is uh, provides some cost effectiveness to, to the whole program. So with this, with this uh, funding, the CAP targets at replacing about 3 million units. I mean, replacing heat sources in about 3 million units and about the same, same number of buildings having improved thermal efficiency. That's, that's a very ambitious very ambitious number. Uh, quickly, a schematic of the arrangements for the store replacement program. And you see the solid, the solid lines are the flow of funds. So the Ministry of Climate kind of disburses the funds to the National Fund for Environmental Protection and Management, which then disperses funds to 16 regional funds for environmental protection and management, who are the ones really um, communicating with the owners, with the actual households, and with the uh, service providers and contractors. And, uh, so they're kind of the, the people on the ground who manage the, the program in the different regions in, in Poland. Provided by the uh, regional regional fund. So, what is the World Bank involvement? Because uh, this until now we spoke about the national program in Poland. So, what is the World Bank involvement in Poland? The World, World Bank is uh, uh, involved in Poland is in the so-called program for results. So, this is a very results-focused um, uh, program. With your objective being to basically improve. Implementation of the of the clean air priority program, 
and increase the adoption of sustainable heating in, in, in uh, buildings. The duration will be five years, so kind of half of the duration of the uh, cap of the Clean Air Priority Program. The proposed loan is $300 million, so much uh, a small share of the total 24 billion euros plan for the whole program. And support will focus on uh, improving energy efficiency. And as I said, this is both the heating source, but also the uh, actual energy efficiency of, of the building, strengthening the, the fund for environmental protection and management in order to optimize uh, uh, allocation of funds and uh, assisting in, in assessing commercial fund financing. Because Poland has re realized that uh, commercial entities are, are, are quite good or it could be better and more efficient at disbursing funding than, than, than national uh, bodies and institutions. But why, why does Poland need this? Um, you might think they have a very um, well thought and, 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 and big program. Why do they need the World Bank to come in and, and uh, improve implementation, so to speak? Well, by October 2020, there were just under 173,000 applications for um, replacing the, the heat sources, out of which about 141,000 were for agreements were signed. Now we saw the targets, 3 million units changed in, in 10 years, which means that in order to achieve the goal, we need 300,000 uh, renovations per year. So this is why the World Bank program will scale the implementation up, uh, revamp the cap a little bit, and uh, as I said, involve the commercial sector and the private sector to better optimize the funding, the disbursement of funding, uh, and, and, and to make that more efficient and also the lower cost of initiative. So the main enhancements that the World Bank will bring to this uh, program it will strengthen the air quality monitoring and enforcement because uh, a central registry for emissions in buildings will be established, which will formalize local data collection. This is very important. Uh, you might think, uh, you might, of course, this is not directly uh, related to replacing appliances. This is very important for planning, for design of the program, for monitoring it, and uh, the implementation of the program and for the monitoring of the results later on. What was the effect of all of this? So data is very key. And uh, this is one of the areas where the World Bank will support uh, this uh, stop replacement program in Poland. Of course, enhancing private capital mobilization through uh, incorporation of commercial banks and one-stop shops to enable uh, owners to access both grants from the cap, but also uh, loans from the banks simultaneously. So they can, they can, they can couple this type of funding and, and, and they can go just to one place, this so-called one-stop shop, where they can, they can um, receive uh, some support. An important point in the World Bank engagement is to bolster the inclusion of low-income households. Uh, as, you, as you know, in many cases in our region, in the lower-income households use uh, solid fuels for heating for one reason or the other, sometimes economic reasons, sometimes uh, not. So uh, the World Bank will design and launch a scalable low income segment to provide additional financing, but also handholding. So not just financing, but also handholding in the sense of uh, submitting applications, uh, kind of things on the administrative and technical side that some low income households might have difficulties with. So this hopefully this will um, improve inclusion of uh, low income households in the, in the program. Uh, enhancing implementation effectiveness and pace, as I said, uh, the CAP needs a wider and more scalable imp implementation if it is to achieve its 10-year goals. So this is what uh, the bank will do through improvement in the planning, program planning, updated technical standards, improved monitoring and oversight, but also enhanced environmental and social systems. And when I say uh, technical standards, I forgot to mention that um, the CAP, that the clean air priority program, the Polish clean air priority program does allow for efficient coal boilers. So coal to be replaced with efficient coal boilers, whereas the World Bank support will not uh, finance coal uh, uh, as, a, as a source, heating source. And lastly, of course, leveraging funding. So establish institutional foundations and enhancements to better streamline uh, implementation, ensure the achievement of results, but also the management of risks. 
So these will be the key tasks of the World Bank in this uh, funding program for stove replacement. And if I can just end with some key takeaways from these two experiences that uh, the World Bank team has had in Bulgaria and Poland. First, uh, the scale of stove replacements needed in both countries, and I say the relative scale because relative to the size of the country and the population, it's, it's large. Um, and, and further, this issue is exacerbated by some socioeconomic considerations such as low income and vulnerable households in, in both countries. As I said earlier, availability of funding alone does not guarantee or is very unlikely to achieve the objectives of uh, stove replacement in the absence of strong regulations and incentives to replace solar fuel appliances. So the, the mere fact that there is funding, even if it's 100% grant, doesn't mean that every, the people with solar fuel appliances will, will replace their appliances. Um, some people are just used to those appliances, others don't see the point replacing those appliances. So that's why funding has to be paired with regulation and, and incentives. Again, coming back to Gennady's uh, introduction, relying solely on, or on grants or subsidies, 100% grants, uh, is not the, optim the most cost-effective option to go uh, with. Not only that, a mix of options and incentives is needed. As you see in the case of Poland, uh, even with the subsidies, they have two levels of subsidies. One is for, let's say, your average uh, earning household, and the other one is for the vulnerable household. And the World Bank will come in uh, when it comes to vulnerable household, even increasing that financial support um, in, in sense, the scale of this support, but also providing some administrative technical support to those to those uh, households. Um, and uh, also, uh, as as I said, in Poland, uh, they're trying to involve commercial banks in the private sector quite a bit because they're they're much they are more efficient at dis disbursing funding than uh, centralized authorities. We didn't sp speak too much about uh, stuff beyond funding, um, but it's very important that for a success successful funding program requires also some institutional, institutional capacities. This is why one of the um, tasks of the World Bank program in Poland will be also to strengthen the institutional capacity of the national and regional funds in, in Poland. We need the capacity for not just implementation, but also communication, monitoring, enforcement, basically for all processes all, all stages in the process, uh, capacity is needed in order to uh, ensure a successful and smooth operation of, of such a complicated program. Because as I said, there's thousands of households using solid fuels for heating uh, with tens of different technical options. So really it's uh, almost a case by case uh, scenario where you, uh, you, you replace a stove with something else. That's why we need such good coordination of all actors involved. I'll stop here. I'm open for questions in the, uh, the Q&A uh, session and thank you for, for your attention. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think that it was uh, really, really good. And for me, the key takeaway, it's basically the involvement of the public sector. Uh, that we should find a way how to involve uh, private banks and the public sector in reaching our targets, set targets. Um, and uh, with that, I would like to give the word, to give the stage to Kirill Rajiv from the Alliance of uh, Energy Efficiency. And uh, Kirill, I would uh, ask you first to present a little bit, to say a few words about what the Alliance of, of for energy efficiency is and what are you doing uh, in Bulgaria and uh, then to continue with the with your presentation I will be really interesting to hear it because I was working for a couple of years in the ESCO, ESCO sector and I am following the development closely. Okay no problem thank you very much to start with, I would like to thank you uh, for having me. Thank you very much, uh, uh, guys from Zazemiata and the Black Sea Energy Research Center. To summarize, our Alliance for Energy Efficiency is an alliance of companies, ESCO companies, that is, whose goal is to develop the 
to develop uh, the business model of a contract with a guaranteed result in Bulgaria. Up until now, we already have 14 companies as our members. Some of them are international, such as Veolia and Siemens, but also local, national, as co-companies. The alliance was set up six years ago. At that point in time, our idea was to start using this business model of uh, contracts with guaranteed results in the country. What I can say is that about 85 to 90 percent of the ESCO projects in Bulgaria have been implemented by the members of our alliance. Perhaps this is not broadly known, but Bulgaria has extensive and uh, quite good experience uh, in uh, implementing this uh, business model. We have more than 20 years of experience in doing that. Other indicators that we can quote uh, the investments amounting to more than 100 million via this uh, business model, that is. Analysis that can be carried out in the public sector shows an investment of below 1,000 Bulgarian left per megawatt hour. For comparison, the very same analysis could be carried out in compliance with uh, the requirements of investments via grant programs. So if you look at the um, data of the uh, sustainable energy development, you will be able to see amounts up to 1,400, 1,500 left per megawatt hour. I'm talking about savings here. So in that sense, we are very familiar with uh, the situation that our country is in. And um, I believe that step by step, uh, we are yielding results that we can share. Fairly recently, we became a national administrator of the European ESCO code. The goal being to set very high professional standards. The idea is to take into account and implement best European uh, and uh, US practices, which would start implementing in a much more efficient way the ESCO model in Bulgaria. We also provide support to our potential customers whose goal is to start implementing an ESCO project. Uh, the key thing here is that uh, there are a lot of competencies to, to use at the very early stage of structuring such an ESCO project. Sometimes uh, there are issues which can uh, eventually lead to suboptimal implementation or the overall failure of the implementation of the uh, project. So one of our ideas is to provide support and help to whoever needs it in terms of such a project. So for those of you who are not familiar with the ESCO uh, mechanism, I would like to share the following. The concept here is the following. Uh, the ESCO company would uh, invest in the customer uh, using its own funds or attracting funds from elsewhere. As a result of this investment, energy savings are implemented, which are then used to, to pay back the investment that the ESCO company has initially made. What's typical here is that the ESCO company is to guarantee the energy savings throughout the contract duration, which can be of uh, 5, 10 or 15 years duration. In the ESCO business model, the contracts can 
be with uh, longer periods of implementation. Last but not least, the ESCO mechanism also covers the maintenance of the assets installed on the premises of the customer. In Bulgaria, we can see that grant tools provided for funding for quite expensive equipment. Sometimes these tools, however, are never even commissioned or they're simply not properly used. And uh, one way or another, um, they never get used at all. So under the Tesco uh, ESCO mechanism, the idea is to avoid such a situation. At phase one, ESCO already has the obligation to make sure that the equipment bot uh, operates uh, in an um, optimum operational mode throughout the whole time. I would like to briefly share with you a couple of advantages which probably the audience would find interesting. As to public customers, uh, the ESCO contracts go below the radar of indebtedness coefficient. In other words, the municipalities uh, that are willing to invest in energy efficiency, but they have poor indebtedness um, ratio or coefficient, they can continue their investment program using the ESCO mechanism. Another important aspect I would like to dwell on is an aspect which uh, we haven't seen in practice over the past several years, but in general, there's this ordinance, ordinance number 16, which uh, gives the opportunity uh, for buildings which are um, municipal or state-owned where delegated activities are carried out. For such buildings, there can be support from the Ministry of Finance. The ordinance itself provides for the extent to which such uh, support can be granted and how it can be calculated. It's a relatively outdated uh, ordinance. It is about to be updated. Most probably this will take place in compliance with the statistical treatment of uh, the ESCO contracts. That's a publication uh, of a few years ago where uh, there is a very good definition of uh, when a contract can be treated as an ESCO contract and when not. It's uh, a very complicated uh, work. I believe it was published by the European Investment Bank, if I'm not mistaken, or at least one of the co-authors was the investment bank. So one of our goals is to gradually start transposing this uh, into the Bulgarian legislation. Another advantage, uh, the long-term monitoring, optimization, updating, and so on and so forth. So these are all tasks which uh, make us constantly try to get uh, more savings and better comfort. As to the guarantee, this is one of the biggest differences. Uh, ESCO contracts give a long-term guarantee for savings. So when you get this, and when you provide this, then the mindset is uh, usually different because uh, people start thinking in the long run and in a very responsible way. So we don't have this uh, perception of uh, a quick implementation and the quick exit. No, the ESCO company is uh, committed to this particular customer for a period of quite a few years. These are the advantages that I can talk about. The last one, which uh, is also one of the main advantages, is that the ESCO company is to provide the financial resource. It's the ESCO company's obligation to do that. It is true that uh, at this point in time, financial resources are cheap. And when financial resources are cheap, uh, then uh, one would normally look for other projects to tackle. But some of the ESCO companies class A have access to such, so they can be used as bridges, to put it this way, bridges towards investment uh, via cheap funding. Uh, 
One of the successes that we've managed to accomplish via the latest amendments to the Energy Efficiency Act, as far as the ESCO contracts are concerned in particular, was that we abolished the ban for ESCO companies to take care of uh, the energy performance audit for the respective uh, projects that they're going to invest in or implement. I cannot really say why this ban was introduced in the first place. There are different uh, types of argumentation for that, but currently the situation as is, is that uh, the ESCO practice Become, becomes uh, very similar to the practice uh, in developed European markets. Another important amendment that we managed to have introduced was to abolish the ban for the customer to participate with their own funding under the ESCO contract. In other words, apart from investment from an ESCO company, what's also allowed is for the customer to invest. In other words, thus, the ESCO model could collaborate in a much more efficient way with grant schemes and other financial tools. Of course, this can take place uh, under the condition that the very programming of these grant schemes or financial instruments allows for such a combination to take place. Under the numerous funds that were provided in the country, it's one of the practices for these funds to exclude more innovative business models such as ESCO. There are other models similar to ESCO which were prevented from supporting this process. We can see that uh, in the statistics of the economic activity of ESCO market on the in Bulgaria for the past 20 years now. We can see very clearly that uh, in the pre-accession period, investments via this business model were constantly increasing and uh, they were scaling up. There was a standard curve of development of a certain service, but once the grant resources started uh, coming into Bulgaria, then this mechanism almost disappeared. There is interest in the Commission, though, for this interest to, uh, for this mechanism to be developed. A couple of uh, projects are underway currently. Rather, their drafting is underway. I'm going to talk about one of these models later on in my presentation. The latest amendment that we managed to have introduced uh, was the following. The transposition of the ESCO clauses from the ESCO directive uh, did not used to be very successful. The version that we currently have of this transposition is a much better one. The rendition is a better one. And this uh, has to do with the emergence of secondary and tertiary markets, which result from these uh, energy performance contracts. The mechanism is a little bit more sophisticated here, but anyhow, one of our tasks was to look into this mechanism in greater detail so that we can come up with wording that would prevent issues from occurring. What you can see here is a screenshot of the database uh, from the uh, Agency for Sustainable Energy Development. This is aggregated data for energy audits. This data is accessible on the website of the agency. Over the past couple of years, this agency has been providing open access to its data thus allowing every company or every stakeholder to see what are the energy savings, what are the energy savings planned, and what kind of investments can actually be made. So this is very important uh, information, and it can be the source of additional business for anyone willing to 
solve uh, issues with uh, energy efficiency that customers have. When the when I last uh, checked that, we're talking about uh, almost 21 million, 1,454 uh, uh, megawatt hours of savings. 1. Point, almost 5 billion left in investments. This is when this, uh, these are the numbers referring to the period when this report was made. Anyhow, that's a snapshot of the data that the agency has at its, its disposal. They're about to publish uh, much more data because they have uh, much more data to publish. And uh, this data can be used to, to target investments in a much more efficient way. Another important driving factor for the market in Bulgaria as to energy traders, for example, is a mechanism which will one way or another be launched uh, in a fully fledged manner. It's good that the big um, players in the segment have already started uh, uh, reporting on the implementation uh, that they have. There are competencies in the bigger traders for investments uh, in um, energy efficiency, also in uh, ESCO companies, which is a great trend. So perhaps that will be the main driving force behind these developments in Bulgaria. ESCO contracts in this particular case could result in uh, certificates for energy savings, which can then be traded, sold, or if the ESCO company belongs to a, an energy trader, which is a common practice, then the very same uh, energy trader could report on how they implemented their, their obligations, how they met their obligations. Another thing I would like to talk about uh, in terms of the market has to do with the obligations of uh, state uh, administration and uh, municipal administration. There are a couple of million uh, uh, square meters uh, at their disposal. As to residential buildings, 170 million square meters in total. That's a segment which uh, we are about to start developing in the future. The National Innovation Program has definitely given some opportunities, but then uh, we saw that uh, once the doors were open, the road ahead uh, is really, really very long. One way or another, we need to focus on this. Street lighting, another important topic I would like to briefly dwell on. It's a topic uh, treated in the sustainable and uh, Sustainability and Recovery Plan. The ESCO mechanism here is uh, foreseen to be uh, a tool for co-funding along with uh, the grant mechanism. So the market is quite extensive. Last but not least, we need to also talk about the long-term uh, program for renovation uh, of the building stock. Quite a few billion need to be invested in this over the course of the next years. This goes to show that we cannot work only with grants. The investment required is much bigger and the scale of the impact uh, really has to be much more major. We're trying to find uh, models which can scale up very quickly. So overall, this is a process uh, which for better or for worse, we are participants in. One of these me mechanisms is the Fin Ergo Dom project. It's a project that we support, by we, I mean we as an association. Colleagues from six uh, countries participate in this uh, project. Poland is also involved here, and Fosch from Poland is one of the participators, uh, participants in this in this project. That's the same fund uh, funded by the World Bank. They participate here. This shows very good activity 
in a very good direction, I would say. We have uh, a Bulgarian participant as well, Economer. This is a company I also uh, work for as a consultant. We have colleagues from Latvia, Austria, Romania, Slovakia with us under this project. It's a big consortium of uh, stakeholders. The task we are trying to accomplish is to is to uh, open a broader field for operations in uh, multifamily buildings. We are going to do that by adapting a model from Latvia, from the Latvian Energy Efficiency Fund. A few years ago, they set up a successful practice for renovation and uh, rehabilitation or retrofitting of multifamily buildings. So this is a concept which we adapted to the peculiarities of the individual countries participating in this project. What is this concept all about? To summarize, it's the following. There are owners of multi-family buildings who have to or who are willing to retrofit uh, their block of flats of prefabricated panels. Quite often, this entails a lot of organization, a lot of communication with uh, everybody living uh, in this building. So by default, ESCO companies uh, have the necessary competencies to do that. In other words, they can allocate time and investments in order to support the customer in taking the next step and implementing the respective energy efficiency measures. The issue that Tesco companies currently face is that uh, their uh, balance sheet starts uh, resembling the one of banks. There is a hypothesis under which, uh, for example, they've given a, granted a loan or they've invested in a huge number of customers. And then uh, their balance sheet gets very negative. Plus, they exhaust their resources in order uh, for investment in new customers. So the Latvian model is uh, to set up a fund to buy um, that out from ESCO companies. As a result, the ESCO companies get uh, fresh financial resources that they can invest in other customers. Respectively, in order for the fund to take such a step, uh, that fund requires a certain set of uh, ESCO contracts, monitoring and verification procedures, and so on and so forth. So there is a standardized uh, set of contracts and instructions that uh, need to be followed so that such a um, deal can be successful, not only for the owners of the, the building, but also for the financial players, providing the uh, financial resource to be granted to customers via the ESCO companies. Kirill, apologies, I would like to interrupt you for a second. Since we are pressed for time, I would like to ask you to very briefly um, kind of finalize your presentation. Of course, of course, no problem. I've already pointed out that the important thing about such kind of deals is to have standardized contracts and instructions to be abided by all stakeholders. In this case, we're talking about uh, funding companies, escrow companies, facilitating companies, customers, and so on. As to this particular project, we rely a lot on an online platform where everything is very transparent and very accessible to all stakeholders. 
what you can see here are pictures from the preparation of such projects and also communication and how it takes place. Such a project needs to be properly fine-tuned, uh, properly activated, so it takes time. As I said, this is uh, these are pictures from uh, from Latvia of the preparatory stage. That is, as a result, we have buildings which are properly uh, renovated and retrofitted. The idea here is that when a, the building is retrofitted, the financial indicators in the long run, I'm talking about a period of 20 or 25 years ahead. So these are financial indicators which give profit to the customer compared to uh, what the situation would have been had they not taken any steps. So that's one of the important conclusions uh, and one of the key aspects that can make uh, customers uh, be more willing to take such a step. These are pictures of other examples. You can see summarized indicators of uh, renovated buildings that have undergone such a scheme of renovation. We are very willing to do that in Bulgaria as well. We are trying to find the uh, appropriate customers uh, where we can uh, implement pilot projects. Uh, this is about to be launched in Poland. And I can say that in Bulgaria, there is interest in the implementation of such a scheme. What you can see on this slide are my contacts. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would be very happy to answer your questions during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, Eva Petkova from the regional fund uh, South Bulgaria with a presentation about uh, loans for single family buildings. Uh, Eva, the stage is yours. And uh, afterwards, we're just going to continue with a short, very short QA session. Hello. Well, I will not uh, take too much of your time. I will briefly present the energy efficiency products targeting single family residential buildings. Um, our um, organization uh, developed uh, that uh, recently and uh, uh, the uh, the loans are available through the United Bulgarian Bank. Um, so um, we are actually a consortium of uh, 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 several funds, the United Bulgarian Bank and the Bulgarian Consultancy Organization. In Um, we are about to apply for uh, funding under the, the Urban Development Fund. After a tender procedure, we uh, um, we have uh, uh, provided uh, more than 340 million Bulgarian lev, of which uh, for 140 million for Sofia and 200 million for South Bulgaria. Since the beginning of uh, 2019, um, we have been providing investments uh, and other urban development and cultural heritage loans. Um, thanks to European co-funding, the conditions of lending are much favorable to users. Our Urban Development Fund has produced an energy efficiency product for single family residential buildings. Uh, we have uh, been facing many challenging uh, 
including in our communication with the United Bulgarian Bank and with the Fund of Funds. In the end, however, thanks to our joint efforts, we have been able to put together this structured product and uh, demonstrate uh, the extent to which our market is open uh, to financial instruments for energy efficiency, such as those that are quite common in Europe. Uh, why this kind of project? Um, previously, the Jessica Initiative uh, did not provide for energy efficiency initiatives, despite the fact that uh, countries such as Estonia had been implementing such initiatives under uh, Jessica, uh, which led to the retrofitting of uh, a large share of uh, residential buildings. Um, uh, it's uh, it turned out that uh, the existing instruments did have gaps in relation to single family buildings uh, in addition to other gaps our fund therefore covers uh, uh, what we call single family buildings but our definition is much broader so the buildings can contain up to six separate units Uh, there is no grant element in our product. Uh, the 59% funding is uh, not grant funding. It's uh, also lending. We really hope uh, to uh, see this product uh, becoming uh, common in the Bulgarian market among uh, borrowers. What are the main features, the basic features of our product? It's a kind of mix between investment funding, urban development funds, and uh, the United Bulgarian Bank's standard consumer loans. That's why it's being classified uh, as an unsecured consumer credit or loan. Uh, the total amount of funding is uh, a little over 5 million lev, and for southern Bulgarian, a little more than 3 million Bulgarian lev. The uh, funding cap is 55,000 Bulgarian lev. Uh, no contribution. Uh, by uh, the, the, the ultimate beneficiary is required. The minimum uh, period of the loan is 12 months and the maximum period is 10 years. How can we achieve these favorable conditions? 59% of the resources uh, have been provided by the fund of funds under the Regional Development Operational Program. 41% uh, of the funds have been provided by the United Bulgarian Bank. Um, as a uh, security, the portfolio security would cover a loss of co-funding amounting to up to 80%. Um, the product is entirely in line with the investment policy of the Sustainable Cities Fund. And uh, the conditions of the European Regional Development Fund. What's the territorial coverage of this product? There are 22 eligible cities in Bulgaria. Um, it's important that applicants uh, should be based 
within the urban zoning area of each of the cities. Um, this is uh, quite a cumbersome restriction, especially in the case of Sofia. Uh, we have applied for expansion of the territorial cover coverage for the Sofia municipality especially. However, uh, making this change would take a long time. Currently, we are not yet able uh, to uh, construe the definition of the territorial coverage extensively. What are the eligible activities? Energy efficiency measures to achieve a minimum of uh, C class energy efficiency, uh, provided that this is this has been prescribed uh, by an energy audit. Uh, works are eligible, provided that uh, they lead to uh, uh, an at least sixty percent to at least sixty percent of energy savings. Uh, another eligible activity is uh, the construction of renewable installations as long as they are not commercial who are the eligible applicant applicants uh, individuals or groups of individuals uh, with a common legal interest what do we mean by that? Um, some uh, uh, buildings have several owners and uh, energy efficiency could only be achieved uh, if the measures are applied to the whole building. Um, to um, ascertain the achievement of a C-class energy efficiency, we require an energy audit. Uh, we are aware that uh, this is uh, quite an ambitious and adventurous project. Uh, but uh, especially in the context uh, of uh, the negotiations, uh, concerning uh, the recovery and resilience plans, uh, our sustainable funds, uh, sustain uh, sustainable cities fund, uh, believes that uh, it's an adequate fund, uh, adequate product. As Mr. Raichev said, grant only funding is not sustainable and it could only cover a very limited group of, uh, um, of buildings. So uh, we need to combine all the uh, capabilities of financial instruments, ESCO companies and others in order uh, to uh, integrate energy efficiency efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you to the last uh, presenter uh, of the day in this uh, second session. And now I'm going to open the Q&A session briefly. Uh, I would like uh, first uh, to ask one question, which is from a colleague of ours. Uh, Ivaevo Klebarov. It's a question uh, for uh, Mr. Zlatev. And uh, the question of our colleague is, who is the address addressee of the World Bank's recommendations in Bulgaria? And who are the players that need to do the most so we meet uh, legal limits and targets in terms of air quality? And thanks for the question. Well, the addressees are, are decision makers at all levels of government because um, as the people from Bulgaria know, we have national, so we have law on their court, which is a national legislation, but 
uh, municipalities are responsible for air quality on their territories. There's also local authorities that, that are um, responsible and have to also do their, their part in the um, uh, air quality management. So it's, it's addressed to all levels of governance, both national and, uh, and local. Uh, thank you uh, for your answer. And uh, do we have more questions uh, from the audience? I know that uh, um, our colleague uh, Gennady wanted to say a few words. Let's see if he is uh, available. Um, I am. Um, can you hear me well? because I cannot turn on the camera. Yes, okay. perfect, we can hear you. I'm already on the street because uh, running to another meeting. Um, I have two questions and one comment um, to our presenter regarding the, the ESCO model. Um, I want to, I'm going to ask everything in one go, um, but um, I, was, I wanted to know um, how you feel uh, that the 100% the grants uh, have been um, ultimately affecting do you think that it could be assessed you know we all know it's it's been detrimental but how detrimental it was for the development of the of the esco schemes and to the last presenter regarding the developed fund um this is something that was uh the, the this fund targeting uh single family buildings is a fund that was considered from very early, I can recall during the previous programming period, which stretched between 2014 and 2020. Uh, why does it come only now? Uh, basically, uh, does it use uh, f mostly funds from the previous um, from the previous period? Uh, and, and why did it take seven years that it couldn't basically take off, uh, get established, and uh, and come online only now? And my last comment is actually about um, uh, the provision of, uh, of financial instruments and the grant component, because very often when it uh, when it gets to, you know, should we abolish uh, the use of 100% grants? Um, we, we definitely think we should, even uh, whenever possible, even the smallest contribution can make a lot of change in the behavior of, uh, of the homeowners. Uh, but I think that introducing certain maximum thresholds for um for grant component per type of measure could work for any type of uh, of residential of, of homeowners because for example if you decide to tackle the heating if you would provide uh, say 1500 euro 3000 bulgarian left uh, roughly as a maximum grant per household this is more than enough to basically provide a 100% grant for an intervention for a very energy poor household and still provide modern heating there without uh, putting any financial burden on the shoulders of, of this family. While 3000 uh, euro uh, for someone who wants to develop an entire heating system in a, in a home, uh, which could cost say, five, six, seven uh, thousand uh, 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 lever uh, for, for the entire network within, uh, say, a floor of a house, this is already half uh, of, the, of the investment. If someone wants to invest in a, um, uh, in a well for a heat pump and provide a, 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 a system which uh, is based on a heat pump, um, and it costs a couple of tens of thousands uh, lever, say 30,000 lever. This is still 10% incentive and it could be still attractive and it could be a drive for the decision of this family uh, to uh, invest. And now back to the two questions that I posed, I would be happy if, if, there is the, if there would be some answers. Thank you. Uh, the support the ask Mojibi. Probably I should start. Gennady, thank you for your questions. The question of how grants affect ESCO and other market business models 
So there is a clear cut answer. Full grants are really not compatible with anything else. Moreover, at least those of us who work in the field are very well aware that uh, there is virtually no market beyond the grant scheme market. Uh, everybody waits for grant schemes to be open and uh, is otherwise passive unless there are grants. And uh, this has an, a negative effect on um, everyone. Grant schemes, in addition, mean cost ineffectiveness. Uh, uh, and uh, if we only rely on grant schemes, our energy savings turn out to be much lower nationally. I leave the conclusions to everyone here. I very much hope that uh, the recovery and resilience plan uh, which uh, will provide further grant funding, uh, will uh, stimulate the market mechanisms in Bulgaria to uh, restart in Bulgaria. Thank you. Hi, from my side. As regards uh, the question about the prog with the, our product and why it's been launched only recently, uh, indeed, uh, I uh, already made made a point uh, that uh, we've been developing the product for two years now. That's because urban development funds uh, were uh, selected in uh, 2018 and we started functioning in 2019. Back then we were already prepared to launch the products. However, the fund of funds and the managing authority required us to optimize some of the financial conditions. We had to negotiate with the United Bulgarian banks in order to meet all those requirements. So uh, at the end of the previous programming period came uh, regrettably, this uh, scheme uh, is entirely conditioned by the previous programming period uh, and the old operational program. Uh, but uh, I can assure you that uh, we really endeavored uh, to launch the product much earlier. But it was only in May 2021 that it was finally launched. Uh, urban, uh, um, urban sustainability funds are lagging behind the operational uh, program. Uh, previously, we would be selected by the European Investment Bank. And now it all develops on the fund of funds. And uh, that's why um, urban development and urban sustainability funds really lag behind the operational program. Uh, our, uh, the, the period in which we can operate uh, has been extended to include 2022 and 2023. Uh, and this period is already overlapping uh, with uh, uh, the new EU crisis response mechanisms, such as the recovery and resilience plan. In the end, however, we hope uh, that uh, 
our product uh, will uh, incentivize future investments and will showcase what is possible. So, И така, In the first one, we're going to uh, speak about uh, the policy updates around the uh, fossil gas phase out. And also, uh, we're going to speak about hydrogen for heating. Uh, is this an option or uh, electrification? It's a better way to go. Uh, in the second panel, it's going to be a second panel, it's going to be really, really interesting. Uh, we have uh, representatives from uh, three countries from our region, uh, uh, Hungary, Romania and uh, Bulgaria. Uh, there in the second panel, we're going to have uh, several very short presentations informing us about the uh, renovation uh, wave, uh, about energy poverty, how the energy poverty and the renovation wave are tackled uh, in the uh, national recovery plans of uh, those three countries. And uh, afterwards, after these uh, three uh, uh, several short presentations, we're going to open uh, the um, an international expert panel uh, with very, very interesting panelists tomorrow. Uh, so hope that uh, I hope I really hope that you're going to be able to join us um, tomorrow too and uh, with that I would like to uh, to wish you a good day a good remain a remainder uh, of, the, of this day and uh, see you uh, see you all tomorrow thank you all